Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the News Impact Summit on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Uh, I'm Vera Pineda, Events and Training Portfolio Lead at the European Journalism Center. And for the next three hours, I will help you navigate uh, through a series of sessions, hoping to inspire you and help you look at diversity and inclusion as an opportunity to challenge the norms and to innovate in your coverage and your newsrooms. I am here at the studio in Maastricht uh, with Angela Rodriguez, uh, the project manager of the News Impact Summits. And we are really glad to be welcome you today uh, to the last online summit of 2021. Good morning, Angie. Buenos Good morning, dias. Vera. Uh, how are you today? Fine. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. I'm very happy to be here with you today hosting our new Impact Summit on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I also would like to say hello to you and to welcome everyone who is already joining us, sorry, in the live chat. And remind everyone the highlights of what comes next. We look into practical steps to mitigate bias and the impact of the European colonialism in writing the news and in the newsrooms. We'll speak with the LGTBIQA plus journalist about media coverage of their communities and how new hiring strategies and editorial decisions can increase their representation in the media. We will wrap up with the presentation of a brand new guide with practical steps that can help newsrooms solve their lack of representation. Thank you, Angie, very much for this breakdown. Uh, I'd like to add that uh, our speakers are experts in these topics and they will share the expertise acquired while working in legacy newsrooms and startups, but also as freelancers to let us know how they are already pushing the envelope and making their coverage and workplace more inclusive. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Lars Boring, uh, the director of the European Journalism Center, who would like to share a few words about the EJC. Good morning and welcome, Lars. Hi, Angie. Hi, Vera. Thank you so much for introducing me and giving me the time to speak to all of the uh, participants in our uh, important summit of today. A topic matter that is very important nowadays, but has actually always have been uh, very important. Diversity and equity and inclusivity really play an important role in where we want journalism to be going in the next years to come. It starts today and hopefully today we are able to get across uh, lots of great insights, lots of inspiration and lots of tools and tips and tricks for you to, uh, to, to, to work on this. At the European Journalism Center, we help to develop, strengthen and support journalism. And while we have a European focus, it's in our name, uh, we have a global outreach and uh, we'd like to live up to that. So um, thank you very much. And also thank you, Google News Initiative, for being our uh, long and trusted partner in this. Let's get to work and um, I hope you enjoy the program that uh, our teams have put together. And uh, I hope you will enjoy also the important things our guests and speakers will have to share with you. And uh, let's make sure that the impact of this uh, has a long lasting effect. Enjoy. Love then. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Hi. Hello. This is the European Journalism Center. Since 1992, we've been helping journalists all over Europe. Now we ask for your support. Join the European Journalism Collective. And with a small donation, you can help us remain independent and sustainable. So we can continue supporting journalists just like you. And do even more. And do even more. And do even more. Thank you, Lars, for this message, and I hope you enjoyed the video. 
Uh, I would also like to thank our sponsor and partner, the Google News Initiative, for making this summit possible. This is summit number th uh, 34 in seven years, uh, and we have Vincent Ryan today, the training manager uh, at the Google News Lab, joining us from Google News Initiative to say a few words about this journey. Hi, Vincent, and welcome. Good uh, morning. Uh, hi, Vera. Hi, Angela. Hi, thanks. Um, so my name is Vincent Ryan. Um, I am training manager with Google News Lab. Um, as many as you may know, uh, the News Lab team is part of the broader Google News Initiative. Um, and we work with newsrooms and media entrepreneurs across the world to drive innovation in journalism through training, partnerships uh, to tackle misinformation, and programs that help create a more inclusive media ecosystem. In a nutshell, the Google News Initiative is our effort to work with the news industry to help journalism thrive in the digital age. And we're proud to be the sponsor of this event in its seventh year. Uh, unfortunately, the situation doesn't allow us to come together, so it's even more important um, for us to create this forum uh, that we can all share ideas. Um, I'm delighted to be connected with all of you and say hello from Cambridge uh, to wherever you find yourself watching. I've seen some people saying hello from Berlin and Spain in the chat. Um, and today at this summit, um, we'll discuss and focus on diversity, equality and inclusion. Um, this is one of the most crucial topics facing society and the news industry is unique in that it's shaping these issues through the lenses of coverage, representation and audience. Um, it's not an understatement to say that the future of the industry is dependent on publishers' ability to better reflect, include and understand their audiences. Thanks to the EJC, you'll get access to experts who've been pondering some of the biggest questions facing the news industry as it evolves and how to tackle these vital subjects. Uh, before I close these remarks, I'd like to thank the EJC and in particular, uh, Lars Boring, uh, all the partners who have helped make these events possible. Um, and of course, a huge thanks to our amazing speakers who we're going to hear from over the next three hours. Um, thank you and back over to you, Angela and Vera. Thank you, Vincent, for this message and for the kind support uh, to our summits. Alongside our sponsor, there is also a list of important media partners that I would like to thank because of their efforts in helping us spread the word about the summit. We are very thankful to all these organizations for helping us inform their communities about this event and for their valuable contribution to the summits. We would also like to mention that the News Impact Summits are not only free uh, and open to everyone. They are also inclusive and the space for open discussion and constructive collaboration since they were physical events. We are proud of our good energy and, uh, and good conduct. Uh, and this uh, shouldn't change just because we are online. So we have a no harassment uh, policy. Uh, so please take a look at that. Uh, the, the link is being shared in the live chat. And be respectful with your comments and behavior so that everybody has a good time. Um, and talking about chat and conversations, before we introduce our first speaker, I would like to remind everyone of our hashtag. You are invited to use it in your tweets and posts um, across uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, about the sessions, and also about our speakers to help more people know about the discussion we are having around DEI in journalism and the media. I'd also like to tell you that at the end of each session, we will share with you in the live chat a link uh, to a very short survey to ask your opinion about the session. With all the household announcements, I think uh, they have been delivered. Uh, it's time to start our sessions, right, Angie? Yeah, Vera, indeed. We will open the conversation with a panel discussion on examples of institutional racism and bias and how we can overcome a century-old mentality associated with Europe's colonial past in the newsrooms and in today's coverage and around Europe. It's a pleasure for me to introduce you to the moderator of the panel, the founder and executive director of Chicas Poderosas, Mariana Santos, and the panelist, Hannah Ayala, the founder of the organizations We Are Black Journals, Lucia Solis Reimer, gender editor at Grupo La República from Peru, and Nina Gedar, Editor-in-Chief of the French media outlet GT News. Thanks for, be for being here. And Mariana, it's all yours. 
Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in this panel, especially talking about inclusion and diversity, which is a topic that uh, Chicas Poderosas, the organization I work with, is fully focused. But today we have the privilege to have here uh, three different landscapes to look at how are the news being made today uh, with very uh, specific perspectives that will bring us uh, different points of view and elaborate in this conversation. So first of all, I would like to say good morning to all of you and launch this first question, which is a question we ask at Chicas Poderosas, who makes the news nowadays? Hannah, would you like to start? Yes, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, bonjour, hola, buenos dias. Um, yeah, from wherever you are in the world, thank you for tuning in. And it's so great um, to join this panel. Um, very, very important question, who makes the news? So if we talk about, you know, all of my career, um, I've been working at the BBC for the past seven years. And when it came to actually creating We Are Black Journos, which launched in 2018, I kind of had to just look back, especially at my particular organization. Now, the BBC was founded in 1927 by an old white man who was very rich and from a wealthy background. And that is exactly what the workforce looked like for decades and decades and decades until we had the first black woman to read on the news. Um, we had the first black man to appear on TV news during the day. So when we look at these questions and reasons as to why diversity and inclusion isn't doing what it's supposed to do, we need to look back historically and understand the root of it um, and understand why we say things like systemic or systematic. Because many of the spaces we're trying to change have not been used to it. Um, it's quite interesting that the people that still have that mentality that you know these places should be the same work in these organizations today. Those are the ones that we need to further educate in order to really um, see true change in our physical spaces. Thank you, Anna, for bringing your perspective. Uh, Lucia, would you like to bring a Peruvian perspective on who makes the news? Hello, everyone. <laughs> I would like to thank, first of all, um, European Journalism Center um, for inviting me to this very important and necessary debate. Um, well, as you know, um, as you said also, I'm a Peruvian. Um, I'm a Peruvian journalist, feminist journalist. And to answer your, your question very shortly, in Peru and I think still in Latin America, um, men are still doing, making the news. And this is the, not um, just one type of men, right? Uh, uh, very wealthy men, white, uh, heterosexual, and always in positions of power, right? So the voices of, uh, of us, uh, women journalists, are still silenced. So I think, as Hannah said, that we have to question and, and review the origin of this problem in order to um, improve and finally accomplish women representation in the news. So I think we're still... Um, very, I don't know, in the back, I think, when we're with, we're with women representation. So I think uh, feminist journalism, um, the colonial journalism can help us accomplish this. Thank you so much. And Nina, can you give us your perspective from France and to Europe and the world? Uh, who makes the news? <clears throat> sure, my pleasure. Good morning, everyone from Paris, then. Um, it's true that journalism is a profession that requires a lot of passion, studying, and that does not make as much money as others. I think it's also an important thing to, to underline. And we can help but notice how they do have the same profile. Um, speaking for where I'm standing, that is to say Paris in France, it's very much linked to um, trainings because as reporters, we must enter a journalism school, which is quite still a high rank and competitive. And when you look at the number in this journalism school, you can help but notice that half of these journalism uh, students actually have fathers that are already executive or member of the intellectual professions, which in comparison is the case on only 80% of the um, French population. 
So it's the first uh, an important number. Um, so basically, what I would like to underline is that the cultural and economic background capital of reporters determines whether or not they stay in the profession more than seven years. Um, and on a personal level, this consideration have always been important to me, but they became even more crucial when I started working with reporters in exile. I mean, before coming to Paris, before coming to France, they were all acknowledged, uh, recognized by their pairs in the country, from Zimbabwe to Pakistan to Syria. Um, and when they arrived in France, it was almost impossible for them to enter the um, journalism job market. Um, according to our calculation, only 10% of reporters in exile actually succeed to get a permanent job in Paris. And I'll just like to say that it adds to a geographical discrimination because in France, all national newsrooms are located in Paris. Well, so uh, different points of the world, but the, the, the situation and the problem comes all to the same, to the same uh, arise. Uh, in the name of Chicas Pedrosas, I represent uh, several communities across Latin America. And the reason why we exist today is the same exact reason. Is back. We, we look at the landscape of media, the media landscape in Latin America, and we see male dominated agenda. Uh, oftentimes, the lack of a gender perspective uh, when reporting, not only gender, but all the other diversities who are not present. And I'm happy to celebrate here this conversation with three individuals who are leading uh, specific news organizations that want to do things differently. So the role of news in creating equal societies. I mean, we believe this is a role, a pillar of democracy, but what we have been witnessing is these disparities and, and this difference, difference in, in, in taking in consideration all diversities. Um, Lucia, can you tell us, um, you as being the first editor, gender editor in Peru, um, what does this bring? Uh, what is your presence and your positioning and your point of view uh, contributing for new, the role of newsrooms creating more equal societies? Uh, thank you, Mariana. Um, well, as you said, I'm a gender editor, which is a very new position in, in Latin America um, newspapers and TV channels. I'm the first one in Peru, actually, and it's a very difficult role, but I think a very important role as well. Um, I, also, I always think of myself and the position I, I work on as a kind of as a teacher, as a diplomat also. Um, and I think that the, the, the special, what makes this job special and also very unique and very important is that we start from the point of view that Journalism is not new, neutral. It can be because we are um, writing from a position of power or for a position of less power. So I think uh, myself as a, as a gender editor, what I do is to review the content of the, of the newspaper, of the TV channel, um, and to review if there is a sexist uh, headline or a sexist uh, story if we can find if i can find maybe i don't know a sentence with a you know machismo idea idea and and just eradicate that so we i i just start thinking i started thinking um when i started this job that we don't we we are not we can be objective it's not the, the goal for journalism Right, we have to be, we have to take a posture against uh, gender inequality. So what we do is to to question this, to point out this uh, this failure of the system of the of journalism because we're not used to uh, question these problems. We're used to just write a story without thinking on how which population are we representing or what are we saying about this population, especially women, uh, migrants, uh, LGBTQ, I don't know how to say in English, sorry, uh, population, how are we representing um, their jobs, their problems, no? Uh, so basically we have to give these populations voices because we, we can't uh, write 
on behalf of them. So the, I think this is what uh, feminist journalism is addressing. And uh, we also um, point out colonialism, especially um, in European journalism. Uh, I'm currently in Madrid when I living in Madrid, where I um, had the opportunity to see firsthand uh, how populations like I come from, like um, Latinos, uh, are representing. So I think this is a very uh, important problem that we have to address. Totally, absolutely. Thank you for your sharing. And do you think your presence have impacted the, like the ways news are being told uh, since you arrived? Definitely. I think that we're starting questioning things that we haven't done uh, before. I think this is a, depending on what side you are, uh, you can see this uh, position are uh, very challenging. Some people, and by people I, I refer to men in power, are feeling uh, defied, are feeling that they're losing privileges, but it's not that. Um, my presence and the gender perspective in general, not just me as a, a gender aide, as an editor, it could be a, it could be a strategy from the from the media, from the company. Um, we're trying to build a better journalism, a more complete journalism. We're half of the world. Women are half of the world, and we have to be represented, right? So I think it's very positive. I think all uh, media should start with this strategy because it. Uh, can help us, as I said, build a better, a better journalism and also question the lack of diversity um, the sexist content we have been doing for decades, uh, the colonial heritage we all have. We all have uh, people from colonized countries and people from countries that colonize, right? So we all have that in us. Um, it's not our fault, but it's our job to, to point out this point ourselves, question ourselves, um, and make a better journalism. Totally. You say something that I really connect, which is it's intrinsic, no? Uh, in Latin America, journalists that I work with, they still look at Europe for standards. They still want to copy Europeans, and then they are just replicating these uh, colonialism methodologies or machist practices, like the sexist uh, um, news storytelling, no? Um, Hannah, would you like... Uh, to share with us how your work as a leader of Black Journals UK is really trying to create these equal grounds on reporting different populations? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one thing that really inspired me to start it in the first place was, this is about maybe like five years into working at the BBC, and I'm working on an international um, you know, news channel where we broadcast to audiences in countries that you're currently in all over the world, South America, and a lot of African audiences as well. Please also bear in mind that many of these audiences, English is not their first language. Just to paint a picture of you, that makes me think, right, I have to create this. So I was working with this big team, maybe there's about 70 people for six months. And I was so excited to meet the diverse, you know, voices that would be speaking to all of these amazing countries all over the world. I was the only black person in that room. Everyone else was white British, white British. Um, and I remember I spoke with the editor and I said to him, don't, I mean, you know, after a few discussions, I said to him, don't you think this is a little bit embarrassing? You know, the fact that you're broadcasting to these audiences all over the world, but the people that are creating these programs are in no way reflecting of that. I'm a big believer in the saying that media can't reflect society if society is not reflected in the media. So from that moment on, I just thought, okay, this is what I want to create. Um, there's also a very shocking statistic that there are 0.2% of black journalists in the UK. 0.2%. Two. Um, and around that time, I was connecting with so many amazing black journalists. I worked all over from Vogue to Science magazines. We, we were present. I felt like we were more than that 0.2% of 
So I created um, We Are Black Journals to bring us together as a platform. So it started with a lot of networking. We had loads of people coming. And one thing that really warmed my heart was when we launched on the 27th of November, 2018, it wasn't just black people coming. It was people from all over. It was people that were fed up of working in spaces thinking, why do I have to, you know, call my friend in another organization to find something out? That person should be working in my exact team. So it was great to know that the message was clear and people had an understanding of why we existed. And last year was very interesting. So, you know, going back to your question, Mariana, of how we're, you know, supporting uh, people. So since the murder of George Floyd, there was a massive outcry on social media. I'm very confident that everyone that's joining this stream right now knows exactly who George Floyd is. Following on from his murder, a lot of people got in contact with us to see what we were doing and they just really wanted to help out. And that is what inspired our mentoring program. So even though we have a community of, I mean, online about 3,000, and our newsletter we have about 300, um, which is growing by the day, um, a lot of people wanted to mentor black journalists within our community. And the really important thing about that is that it's a perfect way to exercise allyship. The definition of allyship is something that we can all do it's noticing that someone is being singled out due to their background or due to the fact that they are already marginalized. So you're actively making that step to want to support them for the long term. The meetings, the checking edge applications, to making them feel confident enough to go for certain applications or to go for certain opportunities in spaces that is not normal for a lot of people that look like them to actually be there. So that is going quite well. And a lot of organizations are reaching out to us because they are saying it straight. We want black journalists. So, you know, let us know who you have. We pay very well. We want to offer this opportunity. And it makes me so pleased um, to see that it's going from strength to strength to strength. But it's, I really want to stress the importance of allyship. It's not having one conversation and then the problem is over. It's supporting that person for the long term. Um, so it's going well and yeah, where we've got so much energy and us to continue to go bigger and stronger and better. This is amazing, Anna. Thanks a lot for sharing. And uh, this allyship that you are talking about, this creating the community of people who share the commonalities, no? Just recently talking to Paula Frey, she's a South African journalist and she runs uh, Frey College. She was telling me, we African journalists, we still look at the BBC, Reuters, Neiman Lab, to, to tell our stories, African stories, with a white lens. So I'm super happy to see that you are trailblazing this new initiative to get people that can really represent their own stories and, 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 and start shifting, no? This colonialism mindset, this this way of some others need to be on top of the others. I mean, the, the white man losing privilege, it's like an uncomfortable position, but it's one that will need to happen because more and more individuals like you are trailblazing initiatives to, to tackle the problems in society that are so screaming, no? especially when they are underlined by media. Um, Nina, can you tell us uh, the wor about the work that you have been doing in France, uh, working with migrant journalists and trying to, to create this more equal society through your work? Um, sure, thanks, Mariana. Um, well, so three years ago, we've co-founded Giddy News, which is the first media who, which aims to challenge the narrative surrounding mi migration um, by um, with like um, a singular newsroom. Um, half of a team um, is um, from different country. Is are actually refugee or asylum seeker here in France. Sorry, <clears throat> and um, well. We were just frustrated as um, reporters by the media coverage on migration, especially since 2015. Um, <clears throat> basically, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> something in my throat. <clears> throat> um, and I think it's very much linked to what you guys said earlier about creating or also equal societies because um, just a, a few words about this um, th this news coverage of the so-called uh, migration crisis, um, because during that time, European media did participate in the proliferation of cliches, of negative images of uh, migrants, giving a rise to an increase of uh, mistrust and suspicion towards them. 
Well, basically, we wanted to do the opposite. We wanted to humanize stories, to give the floor to, to, to people, and on a second level, to rationalize this topic, which is also uh, very much often uh, instrumentalized. Um, by, by some um, politics and um, and it's just a sensation. Um, so we've been doing that work for three years now and it's also very much linked to media education uh, literacy and I think that in order to create a more equal society, journalists, reporters, uh, it's really important for us to, to go into schools in order to raise awareness around these questions. So you are starting to to have this move and moving more into schools and connecting with uh, academic organizations to from the ground up. Yeah, like this is uh, for me. It doesn't surprises me that we are four women leading independent news organizations that are you know movements that are trying to be more inclusive. And right now at Chicas Poderosas, we are trying to give a step back and look at the mainstream media, the you know traditional media outlets the big uh, news that we know about. And we want to, to do a photography and starting in Latin America, then coming to Europe. Uh, how do we measure diversity and inclusion in media? I would like to open this question and, and have you tell me your, tell us your, your insights because for Chicas Poderosas, uh, we have been analyzing the growth or the development of diversity in media, and it has not changed much for the past eight, 10 years, let's say. And we don't believe that this is a question of percentages. How many percentage of women versus men, you know, uh, black journalists versus whites or people from different countries. Uh, how do you think we can measure actually diversity and inclusion in media and see Okay, how, what's the landscape like and where do we want to go if we want to improve? If you can, uh, Nina, if you want to start giving me your ideas about how can we measure diversity and inclusion? Well, um, I do believe that <coughs> diversity isn't a destination that uh, can be fully rich, but rather an active process that you commit yourself to. Um, what I mean by this is there is no magical numbers, as you said, that indicate that things are diverse enough. Um, this being said, if we commit ourselves to the journey of diversity, uh, as a reporter, I know that data is essential to help us begin to understand and deconstruct diversity. So if we do look at the data, it's a fact that in France, the media does not represent the diversity of South City, far from it even. Um, despite an increase in the number of people perceived as non-white uh, on the channel, there's still only 15% of them in 2020, according to a recent survey by a, a public organization that aims to monitor journalism and diversity on the media. Um, it's, uh, and for disabled people, for instance, it's even worse. Uh, they are actually represent 20% of the French population, but they only appear on screen 0.2% of the time, 0.2% of the time. So it's nothing. Um, furthermore, the issue is that um, this, well, this so-called minority um, is overrepresented in situations of uh, poverty, marginalization, or in worlds linked to delinquency. Um, it's, it's a really important topic, and I think we, we are going somewhere. I think the profession in France, at least, is aware of this, is that it's an issue. Um, <laughs> but we need, to more, we need to make journalism more nuanced. That's the key point here, actually. Journalism would be better if we had more voices creating it, um, because diversity also brings uh, the audience closer to the reporters which fosters not only diversification, but also trust, which is currently lacking for many people. Thank you so much, uh, Nina, totally. Um, Hannah, would you like to let us know how can we, you know, and let me just tell you one story, Anna, because uh, I want to connect the dots here. Recently, I was in a Google News, uh, News Guys Summit and I was talking to some Latin American journalists and I was talking to a journalist from Brazil. Uh, he used to be in the mainstream. Now he started his own independent media organization. And he's a white, heterosexual, uh, very literate journalist that went to Stanford and so on. And he was in the chat. We were talking about diversity and equity. And he was telling me, 
I am a white dude and I have super hard time uh, attracting black journalists from Brazil. And this is 55% of the population. They don't want to work with me. They don't want like, and he's like, how can I be an attractive, you know, colleague, boss, whatever to these uh, journalists. And then uh, and I just shoot it to you because I see your face. Would you like to share? Yeah, with yeah of course. And <clears throat> imagine, you know, I, I like the fact that he's just been very open to say, look, we want more, but we can't seem to, to, to get them in. And <clears throat> this is what is very difficult when, you know, it's systemic, right? As I was saying earlier, when these spaces weren't originally built for people who look like us. Now, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of British journalism and organizations that try to do these special like diversity schemes and it can really go one way or the other. I entered the BBC seven years ago on a diversity scheme that lasted one year. And I said, I love this place so much, I am not stepping out. So I'm living proof, right? I am proof of someone that has come in and has been able to stay and excel in their career. And it's what um, my time there is what inspired me to start with our black journals. <clears throat> and then I've also heard of other people who have gone on diversity schemes and have been mistaken for being the cleaner, you know. Um, people didn't actually think that there were journalists working there. So what this person should do, I think, number one, don't put so much pressure on themselves. You're not the only person, but it's so important that you're passionate about doing that. You don't need to um, just go into your organisation to try and see or to try and work towards the change. I'm sure him and his position can reach out to other people who may have a slightly more diverse kind of like working setting. So he could actually reach out to them and ask for advice and tips about, okay, how can I really, you know, make, uh, you know, the, the black people that I want in my, um, in my organization to feel welcomed. What kind of things do I need to set up before they eat, before I even reach out to them? What are the things that I personally need to do? Do I need to already speak to the employees within my workspace to teach them about diversity and inclusion? And the fact that we want to encourage these things, talk to your friend, talk to your family, do some outreach. I feel like there's a lot that needs to be done, you know, looking at your organization before you decide to put people in there. So just look at it like, you know, Cheerios, cereal, right? Like there's th there's loads of different ones, but let's say if you want to create a new flavor, which means that there'll be more colors, you already need to look at what you have to ensure that what you have will work well with what you want, especially with the fact that it never used to look like how you want it to look like. So reach out, there are incredible people on the internet that are working towards the same things that he wants to. So I would definitely suggest outreach, and of course, Mariana, you're more than welcome to connect him to me because that would be great to speak. And never been to Brazil before. Um, it would be great to obviously learn more about, you know, what it's like on that side of the world too. Awesome, thank you. And and just one more question for you, Anna. On on this topic, you remember that the BBC did the 50-50 program to try to bring gender balance. Uh, can you just share with us how that, you know, campaign or program is now being seen. Did it work to make it more diverse? Did it not? Yeah, I have to be careful with my words as someone that's still working with the BBC. Um, I think it just really depends on where you are in the organization. And because I've worked under editors that, you know, really wanted to make sure that th this was target driven. But the difficult thing about an organization like the BBC is that there are so many objectives and things that are trying to be set in place that it's kind of hard to focus on one, and I'm seeing this as a point of an editor working on a program. So with that being said, I don't think it's amazing, but it's it's a slow work in progress. It could definitely be better, but it's a slow work in progress. Thank you so much. And uh, Lucia, I think we are giving baby steps, like you have been saying, like uh, it's not from one day to another it gets better. But do you think having a gender editor, like I heard talking with some editors that sometimes they have a gender editor, but still the white man on the leadership is setting the agenda. Can you share with us your, your experience and if you think this is contributing to improving diversity and inclusion in media? Thank you, Mariana. Yes, um, it's very funny that you mentioned this because uh, I remember in a meeting with... Um, 
several gender editors in in Spain and also in Latin America. I think we um, there are gender editors in Argentina and Peru, and that's it, and that I know. Uh, and this problem came up. It was it is like the the most com the most common problem is that the reject we received from uh, men in power because they are the persons who lead the, 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 the media, right? I come from a very traditional uh, newspaper and, and it is, it's a fight, definitely. It's not easy. Um, we gender editors are uh, often seen as a dictator, you know, as a censor, um person that just wants to erase everything that journalism journalists uh, write but it's not that uh, right I think um it's a very hard job it's difficult because I think it uh, mixes with our personal uh, convictions right because we are feminists we believe in in diversity we believe in gender, Quotas, I don't think this is a solution, but I think this is a, a necessary step. We, as, as media, we have to, to take it. Um, I think it's hard. It, it's been hard for me, very, very hard, not with the writers, um, not with the editors, but with the men in power. And that's what me, what's been um, so difficult. But I think, uh, in the journalist uh, production, the writers appreciate this change. It is a constant debate. We don't have all the answers. We are just learning this. We haven't been taught how to do uh, gender journalism and um, uh, diverse journalism. We have to learn step by step. Um, but I think it's a very positive, we have made a very positive uh, change in our news and also in the public debate, you know, um, because uh, media cannot uh, just write whatever they want, not anymore, at least. Uh, maybe years ago they, they could, but now they, they can't, right? Because we have uh, collectives and other feminist journalists that will point out these, uh, these failures, right? In uh, how you write a story, how you represent women, or or vulnerable populations. So I think that it's just it's a start, but it's good because this is a, a represent a change um, in how we make uh, the news. Yeah, and, and this is refreshing to hear that we are giving some steps, but or observing we have, well, the world, we journalism have normalized gender violence when talking normalized no that's why we need gender editors to teach people how to talk with gender inclusion and uh, we have normalized racism we have normalized uh, infantilizing our victims or our minorities in the way we write and i see more and more these movements of independent feminist uh, journalism organizations or women or non-binary people <clears throat> leading these independent journalism organizations to try to address these issues in in the in the market no but still we still like you said we still have the problem of having the men in power not wanting to give up their power or open up for more inclusion and you know from the point of view of a ceo of a feminist organization uh, it's our main struggle uh, financial st stability which these most main mainstream media already are in the next stage so my last question for you in the last uh, seven minutes before we go to q a is what do you girls think uh, media will look like? Like we are just coming almost almost out of, of this uh, pandemic, uh, crazy twisting the world for the past couple of years where media as well took another role and taking different shapes and forms. How do you see from, from where you're sitting, from your position in media right now and from how you see the future, how do you think media will look like in the times ahead of what, what, what are we living right now? What is coming? Um, I'm very optimistic um, about the future. I think women, uh, women are and um, um, all vulnerable populations are just taking the power the way they can because the people in power, men in power and 
will not um, hand it to us, <laughs> so we have to take it. This is that's what feminists do and have been done uh, in history. So I'm very optimistic. I think that self questioning is uh, the first step, and I think a lot of media are starting to do that. Um, I think we have to start if we want to see a, a change um, in journalism in the whole world is to to start questioning how we are representing, how are we presenting the news and how are we representing uh, people in the news? Are we uh, talking about other vulnerable population on their behalf or we're letting them to speak out for themselves? Um, of if, if we as journalists are taking a position of supremacy, especially in European journalism, like they were part of an advanced culture, like they were saviors. Uh, and as you say, if vulnerable populations are being exoticized, infantilized, as you say. Um, and also questioning if the coverage of, 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 the, of the media are dimensioning the real problem um, or, or if they are, if the problem is treated just an, at, as an isolated event, right? Uh, for example, um, if there is a racist attack in the subway, is the video repeated over and over again without further questioning? Or are we calling specialists, anti-racism organizations, etc.? It's, it's not the same. So I think we have to question how are we representing presenting people and representing the news. Yeah, and it's also, and, um, and this is very important, uh, a matter of presence, right? Is asking ourselves, especially when we are in a traditional media, not just an, in, in an independent uh, uh, media, because it's not that easy. Uh, ask ourselves how many non-white people do we have in our newsroom, in our group of presenters, right? I, I, I very, I'm still very surprised that here in Madrid, um, in Spain, when I see maybe the TV, that all people are white, and we don't even can hear accents from other parts of Spain. Just uh, it's a very uh, capital center uh, way of presenting the news. Imagine just hearing a Latin accent or seeing a black journalist uh, um, presenting the news. It's yeah, impossible. So I, I, I think I'm very worried about that. Um, I'm very worried also because it, the same thing happens in Latin America. So I come from a country with uh, the majority of population are uh, indigenous people. And um, all you see in the media are white people presenting the news and also speaking on their behalf. Um, this happens also in Mexico too, for example. So I think that is a problem. Um, but at the same time, as I said, I'm very optimistic because I think people uh, that had, um, had been uh, silenced uh, are now taking the power, now starting their own ways of telling the news or presenting the news with stories, with independent uh, um, media. And I think that is, this is very positive. And I hope uh, that traditional media that have the power, because that, that's it, they are presenting the, they're the, the hegemonic um, media are presenting the news. I think they have to, to learn from these uh, independent media companies, journalists, and to just uh, maybe pa not pass the power, but also hear that stories and learn that there is no just one way of telling the news. Thank you so much, Lucia. Nina, how do you think uh, the world of news is coming in the future? Uh, where are we heading? <clears throat> well, um, my specialization is uh, media and migration, and uh, I feel like journalism focuses on facts, but it always coexists with uh, objective experience, but we need to create a balance. So two things, maybe in a desirable future, if I can say. Uh, first would be um, fact-checking. I mean, the use of fact-checking during political interviews on the morning news, for instance, should be introduced and made systematic. Um, because in France, at least, the morning news especially is essential in, in dictating the news that is released through the whole day. 
Um, so med is systemic. Second thing, uh, I feel like researchers should, should be given more time for long-term analysis. Um, with the health crisis, with the COVID, the idea that science is a belief instead of a fact has been reinforced. So we do need more economists, we do need more demographers, more historians and so on in the media to talk about these types of topics. Thank you so much. And Hannah, would you would you like to give us your future seeing view? Yeah, honestly, I think just a dream day working in a newsroom would be working on a story and not even having to leave your chair. Because if you're not familiar with it, there will be at least three people around you who are representative of the, you know, the content of the story that you can talk to. Um, people that English is not their first language, people that are disabled, um, people that represent a different, um, you know, gender identity. I think this might sound cliche to say, but we need to keep up with the times because there are millions and millions of people around the world who rely on us to tell them what's happening in the world. And we can do that in so many different ways. You know, to be a journalist, there is, there is no image of it. When I aspired to be a journalist 13 years ago, the first thing I did, I went to Wikipedia, I searched journalist, because I was 15. I didn't know what it meant. And I saw a lady, didn't even, you know, think, oh, like she's white or, or whatever. She was telling news stories. She was educating and informing people about what's happening in the world. And that is what made me passionate to be a, to be a journalist. There should not be any fear or worry from any aspiring journalist due to their skin colour or their background or whether they're able-bodied or not. It should literally be the ability to tell engaging and empowering storytelling. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that a newsroom is representative of the things that I hoped to see 13 years ago and the things that I still hope to see now. People that are purely representative of every single different type of audience can see a bit of themselves in these news organizations. Thank you so much, Hannah, uh, and all of you. Now, we have some questions and points here in the chat that people are asking. Yes, Mariana, no, Mariana, Hannah, Lucia, Nina, thank you very much for this insightful conversation. Actually, we're having a very interesting uh, chat uh, about the possibility or impossibility of being neutral and objective in journalism, and how it is this related with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? I have, we have uh, a lot of questions for you. So the first one we have is uh, from Valentina, and she is asking, uh, could the language used in the news change in any shape or form to encourage diversity and community participation? I don't know who wants to uh, ask her this question. Language used. Yes, the language that we use in news can uh, promote diversity and community participation. Is yeah. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think semantic is uh, essential. And and once uh, once again, sorry, it's mine because it's my topic. But uh, on um, migration, we've seen how how much the, the language did affect. Uh, the life of people. So, for instance, the um, the simple thing to um, to think that migrant and refugee and asylum seeker is the same thing um, is already an issue in itself. So um, we need to educate ourselves more, also in terms of semantic, in order to make it more accessible for everyone. Thank you. Is there uh, someone else that wants to contribute to this question or we can go to the next one? Perfect. So we have also a question from Sebastian. In considering strategies to build diversity, equity and inclusion in European journalism, what roles does education of young people play? What if curriculums incorporate lessons on day in news media? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question um, because it just makes me think of those that aspire to be journalists. Um, what if, like, so for example, uh, many aspiring journalists, not all because I didn't do like a master's um, and it will specifically be in the area that they want to work in. And fair enough, it's all about, 
you know, how to write a story and, and et cetera. But imagine if there was that emphasis on diversity and inclusion, because I find that when some people, when they leave education and they go into a first journalism job, it's almost like, wow, I didn't expect that this part of it was coming. Like, why weren't we told about, you know, how incredibly, um, you know, how much it just lacked in diversity, gender balance. Uh, and things like that. I think that's definitely something that should be implemented and not just for those who are from a black and minority ethnic group, even those from a white background as well, because it starts from that curriculum educational route that we sort of break that normality that every newsroom should be white. Every newsroom should not be white. So if it starts a bit earlier, then it can kind of help to implement a better way of understanding um, because we don't know, you know, all of these people that are entering these journalism spaces, what if they aspire to be head of HR, you know, human resources, knowing that they could pay a part of how people are hired, they could, you know, play a big um, role in ensuring that when someone is interviewed for a job, there are many things that are, are put into consideration to extra ensure that they are from a diverse background. So I think it definitely starts from early to hopefully implement the changes that we want to see later. Thank you, Hannah, for this answer. And I think we have time for the last question. This question is from Kim. And uh, we have a question about uh, community journalism. Do you think this kind of journalism will be more effective to reach diversity rather than traditional journalism? I would like to answer this uh, because Chicas Poderosas, we work with communities around Latin America and uh, we believe in this route um, because we cannot make uh, change the, the head of the business uh, news business leaders to invest funds on being actually diverse and not just uh, having it as a marketing box. So Chicas Poderosas works with the community where we train journalists and then we we train them on collaborative journalism cross frontier, cross borders, so they can talk and uh, report on topics that interest them both, with the gender perspective, uh, with the with all the perspectives we need. So, and then we do collaborations with media outlets to publish these stories. So basically, we are trying to bring diversity into newsrooms, not in the normal form of getting hired as journalists, but. Uh, we do fundraising with organizations uh, like Google News Initiative and Open Society Foundation. We get the funds. Then we train the community. They report. And then we pub we help publish the stories. So this way, we try to put these underrepresented stories in the agenda. Thank so you. I yeah, and I also I wanted to refer to something. I don't know if there is more questions, but I I wanted to say something about the the question of if journalism can be neutral. That I think this is a very common question, um, and I think um, the way we tell news, the way we write news, come from a place, and this place is crossed by gender, is crossed by class, is crossed by race, and the problem is that not all voices have been heard or read uh, in decades and we have heard voices of only one kind of people and that's not neutral either so we can we um th we, with the problems we have nowadays we can't be neutral it's not possible because because we have a subjectivity that comes from the place we're coming from so i think journalists can't be neutral and this is not a bad thing we can be rigorous we can uh, do fact checking and we can be uh, responsible as journalism, but, but we have to represent the voices. And this is not neutral, it can be neutral. So uh, to point out just that this is not a bad thing, that this is a very positive thing. Thank you, Lucia. And what a way to close this panel. I would like to invite you all to stay with us in the chat because we have other conversations so you can continue uh, just uh, contributing and sharing. And now we'd like to go back uh, to the studio with Angela and Vera. Thank you very much, Mariana, Nina, Lucia, and Hannah, uh, for this compelling conversation. I believe that the, the volume of questions in the live chat really show uh, how much people enjoyed and that there is there are a lot of pending questions around this topic. Uh, you have mentioned how important it is to overcome personal bias, uh, to question ourselves in our position of power or lack of, of that in journalism. You have left us with a lot 
to think about around the concept of allyship, the figure of the gender editor, uh, that measuring diversity and inclusion has to become an ongoing task, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We know that embracing DEI is not going to happen overnight, uh, but it is essential to the survival of journalism and to bring it closer to the audiences. So that's why we are going to continue with the, the next sessions. Before we move on, I would like to say we are going to share the link now um, to, to the opinion form in the live chat. So please, uh, we are very thankful that you share your impression with us so that we can keep on improving our events, of course. Um, and Anna should be uh, sharing the link uh, right now. And next, I would like to invite uh, to our virtual stage Yasser Mirza, the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at the Financial Times. Uh, Yasser has broad experience as a diversity leader working in the media and with organizations around the world. Before joining FT, he has spent time at The Guardian, the BBC Studios, the Open Society Foundation, and he has been a speaker uh, at UN conferences on the topics we are addressing today. So in the next 15 minutes, uh, Yasser will cover some of the DEI dilemmas that he has faced and how he plans to approach them to bolster diversity and inclusion at the FT. Welcome to the News Impact Summit, Yasser. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Um, thank you. Um, uh, it's really great. To, thank you, Vera and Angela. I just... Apologies, I just lost connection there for a second. Okay, is that better now? Um, really great to be here at the News Impact Conference and just listening to the earlier session, it was so um, great to hear how inclusion and diversity is very much now a strategic priority for media organizations. I think if we sort of look back and some, some of the experience I've had at working at The Guardian, BBC, Channel 4, um, where, where we are working with environments or working in cultures where it's a quite a strategic priority so with the guardian liberal journalism was at the heart of um uh, of the guardian and diversity and inclusion is very much part of that um whether it was channel four of trying to change societal perceptions on screen around underrepresented and diverse groups or the bbc in terms of reflecting diverse societies now i guess the challenge and the question is um in order to uh make sure your content whether it's on-screen content or what your output is as, as a as a uh, publisher and as a newspaper um do you have to be diverse and inclusive in or do you have to have diverse representation in the newsroom in order for the coverage to be reflective and with that comes an opportunity but also a challenge as well because i guess the question is who represents who do you have a diverse newsroom to reflect accurately as possible um, a kind of a diverse society. And I think the key thing around that is, is to avoid homogenizing diverse groups. What we want to do is get to a place of showing diversity within diversity. So I'm sat here as, as, a, as a brown Muslim gay guy. I represent myself. I have a different lens and perspective of uh, people from my background and communities, but I can only represent myself, not a community. So I think that um, uh, it's really nice to see the conversation really moving on. From uh, from from years back, uh, I probably will kind of go back to the Guardian of of what diversity and inclusion meant and how that sort of worked and and how that built. I think it was um, a really interesting place in that. Uh, very much people were brought into the agenda. They really saw that it was important that we ensure we include diverse, diverse voices in our coverage, ensured that we had a diverse newsroom and making sure that um, the, the content was reflective. Now, when um, uh, when I first started, we weren't so bad on, on uh, sort of being diverse, but actually we could have been a lot better. But for me, I thought the entryway into diversifying and changing societal perceptions and showing more diversity within diversity was to really start to open up the opinion pages. And I thought that was a great opportunity because if you look at the industry, you look at the challenges, um, it's entry, it's attraction into the, into the industry, but it's also how do you succeed when it's a really unique environment when you've got a style of working, a style of communicating, a style of um, 
uh, uh, almost confidence really that really was a little bit alien to underrepresented groups. So it's about breaking those barriers down. And I think as we've gone on, we've seen such great research out there, particularly by the London School of Economics who have talked about the, bar the barriers within the media sector, which is around um, it certainly kind of from the UK perspective around class and around, you know, uh, your educational background, your your family, the, the wealth that you have that really will set you up because it's a really rewarding industry, but it's an industry that's incredibly hard to get into. So if you don't have any support, whether it's financial support or support in terms of your network, it's really hard to kind of succeed into the organization. So I feel like it's we're we're in starting to get to a better place of really understanding and un, unpacking diversity because we we're in a place of ensuring the value of diversity having pluralistic voices but in order to be diverse you've got to be inclusive but then in order to be inclusive you have to create a, a culture of a sense of belonging for um uh for uh diverse employees to feel like they can be at their best but to be at the best you have to create that psychological safety so people can bring their full of authentic selves to work and I'll just give my personal example it took me a long time to come out as, as, as a gay gay man because I came from a certain background and culture which it was pretty hard to be myself and creating the right culture where there's an understanding of you know what it's like being uh, from a background where you're excluded and ostracized and it takes a lot of bravery to, to kind of for, for people to, to come out but then we've obviously had a really difficult two years we've had the pandemic and then we've had obviously George Floyd and what came out of that and now the conversations of equities come back into it and and all of those complex factors of of uh, um, privilege and othering and imposter syndrome and then exclusion and how that's played out and I do feel <clears throat> organizations are a little bit struggling with how to deal with expectations of of i would say sort of gen z and employees of of the values that they espouse um so whether it was guardian bbc or channel 4 there was a real now attention to really amplify and become diverse so most of those organizations had diverse targets and they had a real strong ethos and remit within their or kind of within their purpose but actually often the the numbers the representation in senior positions was still lacking and and the question is why how why is it taking so long um and for me i feel like there is the way you tell stories who you tell stories how people can empowering people to tell stories in their own way is probably the key thing and there there were some building blocks in the guardian in in terms of opening up the opinion pages getting uh, diverse writers from underrepresented backgrounds to tell stories only they could tell but how we could build and support them to really understand what it's like and connecting their stories to um, running um, uh, community journalism, actually a citizen journalism program for, uh, uh, for places in the world where we just didn't have the reach, but we knew we had really great stories. And the two things were we, were, we wanted to help and teach people was around evidence and verification. How do we teach people the right type of evidence for real important social issues and stories but in order for us to verify it we needed those we needed that evidence so we ran sort of citizen journalism programs in the favelas of brazil to the slums of india to rural townships in south africa and i think what that did was is not only created a kind of a reach to all of those really important stories that needed to be told but it also it was a way of educating our our editors and our commissioning editors to the wealth of stories out there so how they can engage in diversity which is moving it away from it's just the right thing to do of course it's the right thing to do but there is absolutely a richness and a wealth of st stories out there and i think once we get to that place of curating stories curating voices but finding ways in which we can reach different types of communities is really really key and opening ourselves up in the way we tell stories because i think certainly in the uk the way um uh certain media outlets look to tell stories there's a certain craft there's a certain way you tell stories and that is very much um led by uh, a particular type of culture and i think we're in a really interesting situation now with um social media has completely sort of changed the way we um way where we have authoritative vo authoritative voices who 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 do we listen to there's so many choices of content out there and and actually um often it's about people who get into 
really good spaces or who can shout the loudest get heard. So um, and facts and and uh, um, you know research and evidence now is it's almost taking a little bit of a backseat to to basically a, st- a strong um, narrative or people who can who can connect onto social media platforms and get their get their reach out there. So it's a really interesting time for D- for diversity and inclusion. I do think um, there's some really great opportunities now because it's very much st- strategic priorities, very much around authentic leadership and finding ways in which you can sustainably diversify the newsroom because it really is connecting to an ever-changing and evolving um, uh, diverse world. So I would say that probably the learnings that I've certainly seen from Channel 4, The Guardian and the BBC is, is making sure we engage in diversity in the right way. I think targets are an indicator for success, but they're not the, they're not the they shouldn't be the only thing that we should be working on because what you need to do is hire uh, hire sustainably um, change the way in which we view um, storytelling and by doing that we're kind of become inclusive and we allow for new storytellers that come in who are diverse and it, who have great talent and also not pigeonholing diverse and underrepresented um, talent to just talk about social issues, just to talk about issues of race or gender or sexuality or, or, or um, disability. It's about getting them to talk about the kind of the nuances and the complexities around so many different issues. And, and actually, any good uh, media organization and journalist will be to be a good journalist and uh, a good media organization on diversity. It's just it's very much inherent in the fabric. So a good journalist has a black book that has contacts more different sections of society, is curious, has the ease and understanding to work with underrepresented groups. So we talk about all of the the the, the complexities of privilege and if you've been othered, if people have imposter syndrome, if people just don't really understand and connect to the way the, the world of media works. I think it's about having a, a kindness to that and to, to be um, a bit more open to the way uh, how people consume content and how they can relate to brands. So I think um, it's a really great opportunity. I mean, at the FT, I would say, and just recently joined three months ago, I, I feel like it's a great sort of brand in that it's the critical friend to the world of business. and should be a home for all diverse talent. We have um, um, most of our core readership is actually white men. Now the question is, why why is our readership not more, more diverse? Do we need more uh, more female writers, more writers of color to reach out to those minority or diverse readerships? Um, and I would say yes, but I also think there's a bit of breaking down the perceptions and the and the and the brand that the content should be appealing to everyone. So we just kind of get the balance right of not going into those kind of um, um, homogenizing diverse groups that they'll only be interested in certain content if it's produced by a certain individual. I think that content can be so far reaching for everyone. Um, so yeah, that's a kind of an overall summary of, of uh, I guess, my experience of diversity in the media. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Yasser, for sharing your experience and the, and your knowledge. Several ideas will will stay with us, um, and the things that can be done at legacy uh, media, but also other newsrooms to hire more sustainably, review the process of storytelling and um, and how the content is produced. So. Uh, we'll be talking with you again during the Q&A after the second lightning talk. Uh, so please stay with us uh, to follow the next chat. It is now my pleasure to, to introduce you to Lara Joannitz. Lara is the BBC's creative direct, uh, diversity lead for 5050. Uh, she oversees a number of initiatives to ensure the BBC content represents a fair society as a whole. This is not Lada's first News Impact Summit, as she has been a panelist in Munich at our first summit addressing diversity and inclusion precisely. And uh, today Lada is sharing with us uh, some of the lessons learned since the BBC 5050 initiative expanded its scope beyond improving uh, the representation of women to becoming inclusive of disabled people and those from ethnic minorities. Welcome, Lara. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back and sharing the progress that we've been making. So um, 
5050 The Equality Project is an on-air initiative. Um, and just as everyone's been discussing this morning already, and as Yasser was saying, um, it's really important to have diverse representation behind the scenes in the workforce so that you can have really authentic um, and inclusive portrayal and representation as well. Um, so this is one of the tactics that we're using at the BBC to ensure that we have um, diverse and inclusive content um, by setting kind of targets and having our teams kind of work over time to really make sure that they are achieving those targets. But that's just kind of one scope. So um, for those who aren't familiar with 5050, I'll share a quick video now, um, if that's OK, just so that you can see our progress and go through a few slides um, to show you how we are um, you know, using 5050 to, um, to make a difference. What and who you see and hear in the media matters. A diverse media is critical to properly represent a diverse world. 5050, the Equality Project, is now making a difference at the BBC and further afield. The aim of 5050 is simple, to address the historic imbalance of voices in the media and increase the representation of women. More than 650 teams are involved across the BBC from news, sport and children's to music, comedy and drama. And each team simply counts the contributors who appear in their content. To ensure a balance of voices that reflect society. A society where 50% of the population are women. And it's working. 36% of teams were producing gender balanced content when they first joined the project. By March 2021, that number had risen to 70% and audiences are noticing. 58% of women aged 16 to 34 said they consume more BBC content online as a result of seeing and hearing more women. This isn't just happening at the BBC. From newsrooms to classrooms to conference rooms, the 5050 Global Network is driving cultural change in 26 countries around the world. 100 partners have committed to the 5050 Equality Project. With 41 taking part in the March Challenge. Half of those featured 50% women in their content, up from 31% when they first joined the project. This is only the beginning. At the BBC, 200 teams are now also working hard to increase their representation of disabled contributors. And those from ethnic minority backgrounds. And some are already seeing an improvement. All this in a year when the coronavirus pandemic has impacted lives and industries globally. Through 5050, we're ensuring that more voices are being heard. Whatever challenges lay ahead, the BBC and the 5050 Global Partner Network are striving to create content that better reflects our world. So 5050 um, started um, as a gender project and we were just called 5050 and now we're called 5050 the Equality Project because we've really learned a lot from monitoring gender um, and we want to apply that to um, monitoring ethnicity and disability as well. So what you can see here is a graph um, showing the, the same results from um, the video there from our March challenge but how we improve over time. So for teams who've been in 5050 for at least one year, what's really interesting is we're kind of sticking at 70% um, gender balance, but as time goes by, more and more teams are getting closer to that target. So um, for, every, for teams who've been uh, doing 5050 for at least one year, you can see 9% are featuring fewer than 40% women. Um, and then that goes down to 5% for people who have been doing it for at least two years. And then what was really exciting to us is programmes who've been taking part in 5050 for at least three years, absolutely all of them had at least 40% women in their programming. So of course, we want to get more to the 50% mark, but it shows that even those who for various reasons may not reach 50, maybe they're at 47, 48, 49%, um, they're still kind of getting closer to that mark. So what we've seen is, you know, change doesn't happen overnight. It really is creating a cultural change that is um, having a really slow and hopefully sustainable impact. So 
we announced in October that we would be applying this to disability and ethnicity representation as well. Our targets at um, the BBC are 50% women's representation, 20% ethnic, ethnic minority representation and 12% disabled representation. Um, and those targets um, are adaptable according to the programme's um, population demographic. So the ones that we've got 50, 20, 12 here are kind of general UK domestic, but where we have regional teams, for example, or international teams, they are adjusting those according to um, the actual population that they are serving and targeting. Um, so for example, um, BBC London are aiming for 50% ethnic minority representation. Um, and of course, these targets are adjustable as well as we get more information and we've just had a census in the UK. So we're waiting to see um, what that gives us and then we'll be adjusting our targets in line with that. So it's very much kind of um, movable and um, adaptable to make sure that we are representing the audience as accurately as possible. Um, and we aren't yet at a stage where we're um, publishing that data in the way that we have just shown you with the gender figures, but we will be doing that in our next April report. Um, but this year we asked teams who'd been taken part in a pilot for this monitoring, how they'd been doing um, over the last six months. And we saw that at least half of those had already shown an improvement in just a few months. Um, so while they may not have all been reaching their targets, um, they were seeing an increase in the representation of um, ethnic minority and disabled contributors. And that's in a really short space of time. And also during the COVID pandemic, when teams were in, in the UK, at least, we had very long lockdown over Christmas that seemed to go on forever. Um, lots of people off sick, lots of people struggling with caring duties as well. So it was really fantastic for us to see how dedicated the teams were and how much they really cared about it. Um, some of the challenges we faced in um, kind of introducing this and implementing it is really um, very just logistical, you know, trying to implement it in the workflow, giving teams um, the confidence to kind of figure out how to collect data. You know, not all journalists are very good with data. You, we have like fantastic data journalists, but many, you know, work with words. They don't like the look of spreadsheets. Um, it makes them nervous and also dealing with really busy deadlines, um, lots of content to get out in a short space of time, particularly in newsrooms. Um, so, you know, some of those challenges in trying to bring people on board and help them understand the importance of this. So we try and keep it really simple at 50-50. We set spreadsheets up for um, all of the teams. They don't have to do any of that themselves. They literally get given the spreadsheet and enter the figures in themselves. We also make sure that the spreadsheet is exactly how the team needs it. Um, so while, for example, we are looking for um, that overall figure of whether they're hitting 50, 20, 12 percent. Um, in the spreadsheets, we do have individual columns that break down the groups further. You know, as Yasa was saying, it's not just about kind of homogenizing groups. Um, our teams will also want to see within their ethnic minority representation, you know, how are they representing um, Southeast Asian versus East Asian versus Black and African Caribbean. You know, they, they don't just want to kind of hit the what we call in the UK BAME ME target, it's important for them to really use that data in a really meaningful way. So we try and make it as easy as possible for them in that way. 50-50 um, is a perception-based project mostly because as many of you will know as journalists, it's going to be very difficult for you to always be in contact with every single contributor that you feature in your pieces. Perhaps you're using a clip from agency material or something from library, or you know it's just a quick vox pop and you haven't had the time to really ask someone their sensitive and personal information. Um, so what we say to teams is, you know, if they are doing it by perception, to use any publicly available information about the contributor and whether they have a disability or what background they may be from. So that could be something that's mentioned on an organization's biography page of them, if they're an expert or a spokesperson, or you know something that they've put on social media, anything that they've publicly disclosed. And so that's how we've been doing it that way. But we do have a small number of teams who do have direct access to every contributor, whether it's um, you know an interview program like Hard Talk um, or a longer form documentary program. Um, and they have the opportunity to collect actual data by providing their um, contributors with diversity forms to complete. And we worked really closely with the BBC's data protection and legal teams um, to ensure that we are doing that in a data protection compliant way which is another thing that lots of people will kind of find quite overwhelming and you know everyone's very afraid of getting this wrong in the UK we've had a recent overhaul of GDPR 
Um, and so, uh, you know, it tends to put people off a bit, but we try to make sure that we've done all that work so that we can explain to them in the most simple way and they're, they're not afraid that they're gonna do the wrong thing and potentially disclose someone's personal information. But that is, I think, some of the biggest challenges that we've seen in trying to do this work where it comes to protected characteristics such as ethnicity and disability is just the paperwork and the admin around it to make sure that we are protecting our contributors' information. Um, we are also working on developing some tech to make it easier for teams. So what you're seeing here are some screen grabs of a dashboard that we've been using um, at the BBC for a few years now for teams to report their gender figures. Um, and it's worked really well to help drive the progress because it gives everyone a deadline to work towards in a simple place for all teams to report their monthly gender figures. Um, and it's also open to everyone in the BBC. So the, the other grab is a kind of comparison page where teams can go, they can see everyone's progress since they joined the project and compare with other programs and departments as well. And we found that that transparency is really important because it's not about shaming anyone if they're not reaching their targets. It's about celebrating their successes and also working together to improve where we can and see maybe where they might be struggling. Um, and also the healthy, healthy competition there where they can compare against each other really helps as well, especially as you get to the end of the month. Um, we're really excited actually at the moment. Um, we are working on a new tracker to enable us to collect ethnicity and disability data in the same way because we this dashboard currently only works for gender and um, Stanford University's computational policy lab has been working on a new tracker for us that will enable all the teams to enter their data into the tracker so we'll be able to get rid of those spreadsheets which I think will make lots of the journalists very happy and they'll submit their data there and then submit their monthly figures as well all in one place so again it's with, you know, we're making sure it's data protection compliant. We're also making sure it's really simple for busy teams to use so that they don't have lots of different links and places to go. They can all put it in in one area and it will really help show them in a visual way their progress so that they can track it and share it with each other. Um, and that's one of the most important things of 5050 is kind of sharing the information and speaking with each other about who's struggling, how did they overcome certain challenges that might be able to help other teams. Um, and so we're finding that now with ethnicity and disability as well because you know, we've only we've only just been doing it for about a year now, but um, some teams are taking a bit slower to join because of all the challenges we've been facing around COVID. Um, that you know, hopefully uh, the new the kind of original um, starters of that will be able to share their learnings. Um, and one of the key things I think um, for us is, you know, we collect data to drive change. So it's not just about the data. It's definitely not just about the numbers. The whole purpose of collecting the data um, is to make sure that we have quality representation and we're changing the way our teams think. So there are a few other things that we um, have been doing um, to help our teams. One is we have a database of new voices. So we call it the new voices database and it's potential contributors from all different backgrounds who maybe don't often get the chance to speak in the media and we don't know, we don't have in our black books as Yasser was saying. Um, so we don't have the kind of normal faces and names that we're always reaching to when we're under tight deadline and we need to turn around a quick interview. So this database um, features um, more than 2000 contributors, mostly women, because it started as an expert women's database and now we've expanded it. And the contributors have the opportunity opportunity to state uh, what their ethnicity or race is and whether they have a disability and that will help our teams to know how contributors identify and to find more um, diverse people to be speaking to and featuring and that's something that we're, we're really trying to kind of grow and develop and get more contributors to add themselves to that. Um, we also have a few other projects that we work on um, within the creative diversity team that I'm part of. So we have a reframing disability program which um, we are doing with Media Trust, a charity in the UK, and that is offering training to disabled experts in a range of subjects to give them the confidence to do media interviews. But equally, as part of it, we've been offering content makers in the BBC training to so that they can make sure they are making reasonable adjustments for disabled contributors and they know how to provide access requirements and make the contributors feel safe and understood and protected and also um, how to make sure that we are telling these stories in the right way whether it's just the language we use or the types of stories we're commissioning and making sure that the content is accessible as well um, and then we also have a program at the BBC called BBC Elevate which is about progressing disabled talent so that's a behind the scenes um, workforce um, project um, to make sure that you know we have staff who are being given opportunities that they may otherwise have been overlooked for because it may have been too difficult too difficult or someone else has been kind of shot over them so um uh that that's kind of important step in terms of how you know behind the scenes representation really feeds into on-screen representation 
Um, and then finally, you may have heard about our new partnership with Netflix um, in the commissioning budgets for um, content that will be made by disabled creatives. And they're going to be looking for and offering um, funding for projects specifically made by um, a, you know, a variety of disabled creatives, whether it's production, writing, filming. Um, and so, you know, those all kind of feed into the same thing. You know, who's telling the stories behind the scenes, but also who we're featuring in those stories and the stories that we're telling are really important. Um, and one final thing that we have also been doing to really ensure that um, it's not just about the numbers, but it's also, so it's not just the quantity, but it's also the quality of the representation um, is some re audience research we've done with Ipsos Mori on inclusive language. Um, and that is to really kind of help to understand how audiences and communities in the UK feel about media coverage and portrayal, um, and also to use that to turn into guidance for teams so that they feel more confident when telling certain stories, they feel they understand the issues around representation more. And we've produced a um, really interesting report called BAME, We're Not the Same. So in the UK, we have um, quite a controversial term now um, that um, used to be used more commonly uh, for Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, uh, BAME. And it's exactly to what Yasser was saying. The point is, we can't just homogenize, homogenize everyone and put them in the same group just because they are not white. Everyone's different and has their own stories and their own experiences. So um, this research really looks at how people feel about the language used in media and content um, and also things that content makers need to be doing to ensure um, kind of accurate and authentic portrayal and to make sure that we're really getting those nuances and that intersectionality and to avoid stereotypes and change the way we are presenting our stories and telling them. Um, so, yeah, so um, those are some of the things that we've been trying to do. But, you know, there's so many different tranches and um, aspects of um, diverse work that all need to work together. And so one of them is kind of targets and data, but the other one is a much more deeper um, understanding and changing the way people think in the media about the stories they're telling and who they're reaching out to. So thank you, Lara and Jasir, for these amazing and inspiring talks. We have a lot of questions and comments in the chat and we are been uh, gathering some of them. So I think we can uh, start. Uh, let's. Uh, go over this question from Larissa and uh, she's asking about sources and content. Do the journalists themselves make an enough make enough effort to find experts with diverse backgrounds and identities before relying on the circle of the usual suspects for their products and maybe how in your uh, media how you promote this this diversity in sources and in consequence in content? Um, I'll just jump in on that one quickly, if that's all right, Yasa. Um, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to do with 50-50. Um, you know, there will be journalists, I'm sure, who always do go the extra mile and make that effort to reach out to find different experts. But we're trying to encourage everyone to do that so that they kind of think twice before just going, OK, that's the story. I know that person. I saw them on. Well, you might have someone, for example, who works on a TV program who said, oh, yeah, I heard someone on the Today program on Radio 4. I'll just call them and get them on. And actually, we don't want to do that. So it's partly about changing the way teams think so that every day they have a reminder to try a bit harder and dig a bit further in terms of who they're speaking to, but also having kind of the permission and encouragement from the top, from their management, to maybe take that extra time, spend an extra 15 minutes putting calls in and reaching out and trying to kind of um, make sure that we're being representative. Because I think it also comes down to pressures of deadlines and feeling like you just need to get something out as fast as possible. And I think if you have an editor, you know, I've seen various examples where someone will kind of have a piece that they've done and the editor will read it and say, no, nope, this isn't good enough. Everyone in that piece is white, you know, go and find someone else. So if that starts to become the norm, then the journalists will start doing that before they take that first draft or that, that first version of the piece to the editor, because they know that it's going to get sent back. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, thank you, uh, Lara. What about you, Jesse? Um, Just completely echo what Lara is saying. It's really good to see Lara again uh, from my time at the BBC. <laughs> it's that, it's that, it's that uh, bit of the Black Book and having reach and having sort of, so it's firstly about creating that trust and the reach and the leverage with underrepresented and diverse groups. And how do you have the deep understanding and connection to avoid this show me your leader and go to that one person and suddenly they feel like they have that, they represent all of those voices. So I think part of it is, is extending the black book 
the other part is is to really get a deep knowledge and understanding within ourselves because I think sort of journalists um, uh, sometimes need a bit of help with really understanding so if you're at ease with the subject if you're at ease with diverse groups and then you start to see people as individuals and then you have access so partly is building trust partly is um, a, a bit of sort of awareness and education ourselves and the other one is where to go to because what you also don't want to do is just go to that individual to talk about social issues you know if you've got a story on economics you want to make sure the participants on economics come from a, a wide a wide range of backgrounds and they're talking about economics as opposed to their identity now their identity will shape the content it was so it will shape their opinion on on like this economic story for example so i think that's the nice nuanced way to kind of to reach out so it's about going to the ingredients of what a journalist is is to be curious and to be curious is to to kind of be curious to all sections of society. Thank you, Lara and Jacin, for these answers. Now we have a new question. Uh, to what extent does contemporary journalism reflect the heter heter heterogeneity of the world? In Italy, there are almost no foreign journalists in the newsrooms. That's a really good question. It's an interesting one. It reminds me of the time uh, we did this uh, Council of Europe project of reporting on diversity within Europe, and they brought over uh, journalists from all parts of Europe together and talking about, um, so what this question speaks to is, is around culture and nationality and, and reporting on um, the kind of the issues of, of a country. So obviously, if, uh, if, your, if your newsroom is um, uh, has no foreign uh, journalists, and the topics are very much about national it, it, national stories, and those communities are not as diverse as others. I think that's probably the tricky one. Um, and I certainly remember the Council of Europe project we were talking at on diversity and inclusion. It just meant so many different things to to different European journalists because in the UK we have a lot more of a a, a deepness around diverse Britain, whereas in other parts of Europe it's a, just a new concept. It was about how migrants were reported on as opposed mm. to um, the culture. So I think, look, I think, I think first, first and foremost, what this question speaks to me is about a deep understanding of what does diversity and inclusion mean for your actual country, your context, your reporting. And I think getting an understanding of that then avoids um, misunderstanding of what, what this means. Lara, do you would like to uh, compliment? Yeah, and just, I mean, just to add on that point, I think, um, you know, particularly speaking about the UK, as Yasser said, you know, we we do have like, a, there's, you know, a lot of work done, a lot of kind of understanding and programming around diverse Britain, but it's really important to um, kind of avoid the stereotyping of talking just about migrant communities or talking just about the Muslim community in respect of terrorism or in respect of kind of specifically related to religion. You know, there are people now, particularly, you know, in in the world that we live in today, people have moved around the globe for, for decades and decades now. And there have our first, second, third generation people who, yes, have different backgrounds. I mean, I myself, I was born in South Africa, but my father's Greek and my mother's Italian. And now I grew up in the UK. Like, I'm a citizen of the world. I don't really know where I where I'm come from, but I think there are so many people like that in countries all over, and um, it's important that their stories are also rep like respected and told that they are just someone who grew up in this country. But yes, maybe their parents or their grandparents are from someone else, but that doesn't define who they are, and they shouldn't just be labeled as that group. And so we need to make sure that that we're, we're doing that and not just seeing it really separated as right. So the white Italians and the white Europeans versus the migrants or, you know, the immigrants and all of that. Thank you, both of you. And I think I, we have time for one last question. And we have two participants that were curious about the financial side of this kind of initiative. So maybe the question will be how uh, media can start these initiatives like 5050 or the initiatives of the Financial Times? And on the other side, what are the effects in, fi in the uh, financial terms of these initiatives? Uh, so um, I'll, I'll go there first, just in terms of 5050. Um, it kind of started out of nowhere and it was just a pet project 
of or passion project of one of our pre presenters on World TV who decided to do it themselves. So they set up their own spreadsheet, they started monitoring, and then other programs heard about it. And it just grew organically from there because they were kind of sick of hearing about let's try to do something, let's try to do something. And I think when you know you're going to have an initiative that needs funding, it has to go all the way to the top and it gets held up by red tape and conversations and turns inside out so um, they just decided to do it and then because it took on a life of its own it got to a stage where actually the then director general Tony Hall was like wow this is actually happening so now I'm going to put some money behind it and we have funding very very small amount of funding for a permanent team to do this and we have a lot of external partner organizations who've signed up as well so the Financial Times for example is a proud 50-50 member um, and other, um, other media and non-media organizations and it really changes depending on the size of the organization and, and you know what they can do. So we have a lot of volunteer teams or people who've been kind of asked to do this and take on 50-50 as part of their job. So there is no funding going to it, but you know, everyone's just rolling up their sleeves and mucking in. And then we do have other organizations like ABC Australia who have also hired people specifically as 50-50 roles and they are putting money into it. So it really, you know, it isn't something that you have to have money behind. If you have the will and you have the motivation and the support, you can do it. It does mean, of course, that there are going to be extra hours worked. But I think um, don't let the idea of funding put you off, get started. And then hopefully with it, when you prove it and when you prove the example and show how successful it can be, then the bosses will come on board and, and maybe support you with funding. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's such a great answer and I completely agree. It's about, um, I mean, the great the great thing about sort of organizations now is we have a DNI function within there, but the function and and the, as Laura says, it's about getting an idea, getting a project, taking it to the top, getting the support, galvanizing the organization. And when you can connect people, the people power at the beginning stages, it's actually not the, the finances are what you look for at the end. Um, it's about um, looking at the idea, look at, look at the, the value that it brings the, the organization in terms of its reputation, in terms of sourcing new stories, in terms of finding new talent. And then you, then you look to um, uh, get sort of funding for it. But then for me, I think actually the, the biggest resources are the people within the organization, the different experts. So I think that's the job of, of connecting and bringing people together and, and showing the value of whatever initiative you want to do. And the key thing I think about any initiative, it's sustainable and look at 50-50, how it started off and look, it's growing and growing and growing and, and um, others are following by example. So it's great to see. Thank you both for your answers. And I think it's time to go back to the studio. And of course, I invite you to stay in the chat because there are a lot of questions and it will be great if you can continue the conversation with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasir and Lara, for being here today with us and for sharing your knowledge on how legacy newsrooms can tackle diversity and inclusion. We'd like to know also from you, our viewers. So please click on the link that our colleague Anna is sharing now in the live chat. Up next is our panel on LGTB IQA plus in the media industry. Wave the rainbow flag, but for real. It's meant to be a candid and an open conversation about the LGTB IQA plus coverage in the mainstream media and the role of the LGTB IQA plus journalists in the newsrooms. Leading this conversation is Rachel Savage, LGTV Plus correspondent for the Tosson Reuters Foundation, Marco Albertini, editor in chief of Prime Magazine.it, Schold Erdei, CEO of the Hungarian Media Human and Pink Budapest, and Nikki Vandini, freelance sports writer and broadcaster specializing in European football and the NFL. Thank you all for being here today and looking forward to this conversation. Rachel, it's all yours. Thank you, Angela, and thank you to the EJC. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here for a, a panel discussion about, and I'm going to use LGBT+, plus just because that's the, the acronym I'm used to, so I'll, I'll trip myself up if I use a different one. Um, but we're going to start with looking at how the sort of the so-called mainstream media in Europe covers LGBT plus issues. Um, so Jolt, I'd like to come to you first, because Hungary has kind of been, you know, in the headlines a lot this year because of um, LGBT plus issues. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about 
um, how Hungarian mainstream media and actually European media as a whole, how you feel they've been covering LGBTQ plus issues. Have they been fair? Have they been accurate? Have they been, you know, discriminatory, not discriminatory? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Zsolt Erdei from the Human Media Group and the Pink Budapest, the Human Travel Tourism Association. I'm a CEO and the founder of the association and uh, the human media as well. So the question is interesting now in Hungary because uh, if we, we see the news every day, uh, we, we always, we, every day we can see one or two or more uh, LGBTQ topics uh, in the Hungarian mainstream media. Uh, is it good or no? <laughs> this is the question. Yes, it's it's good because uh, because the Hungarian media can uh, show more about the LGBTQ life now, but it's not good because uh, we had a law, uh, and after the law, we we have uh, we had. A, so many problems with uh, with this law and with the situation. But I always start my conversation and, uh, about one important thing. Uh, the government, uh, mm, no, the the people not people didn't change in Hungary. People still open in Hungary, open in Budapest the communication of government is different but the people are different in hungary and uh, this is the most i think this is the most important thing and if you see the a news uh in in the social media for example if the if the online magazine posted a uh, a news about the lgbtq topics and you can see uh, I don't like to see, I don't like to read <laughs> the comments, but you can see there are more positive comments than negative. And day by day, there will be more and more positive comments than, than negative. Uh, I, have a, I have a personal story because uh, uh, my father, doesn't like to talk about the LGBTQ topics, nothing. Uh, he, he doesn't like to talk about my life, my work, nothing. And uh, on today's Saturday, on Tuesday, I talked with him, uh, he called me, and first time we talked about my job, and he told me, you have to do it because it's it's a good thing, and uh, I think so many uh, uh, heterosexual straight people uh, follow to your magazine and uh, to your channel and everything. And uh, he told me this is a good business, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's that's good to hear because you know we get a lot of negative headlines coming out of Hungary, so it's it's nice to hear some positive news as well. Um, Marco, um, yes. what's the situation like when it comes to the coverage of LGBT plus issues in Italy? And I know Nikki might have some opinions on this as well. Um, but if you just want to start, Marco. Yeah, I have uh, a number that I can tell you. And uh, in Italy, the Association Diversity, together with the University of Pavia and they make uh, every year uh, an, a survey about uh, how uh, the most important newscasts cover five uh, different diversity so like age disability and uh, women and also lgbt of course so in uh, during 2020 from january to december uh, they scrutinized uh, uh, a total of 42,953 uh, news in total. LGBT news were only 102, which is 0.2% uh, of the total. So I would say that our voices, uh, let's say in the mainstream media, are totally underrepresented. 
like if we were non-existent. In Italian, we can, you can use a euphemism. In Italian, it's called benaltrismo. It means that any other thing is more important. So um, uh, the question is that if you don't talk about something, it does not exist. And also what I think is that uh, the narratives or the storytelling on our issues are not under our control. And uh, I see this as a big problem because as I see it as a kind of a new colonialism with an updated equivalent of uh, a colonial damage. It means we include you, we talk about you sometimes, but uh, uh, we not as you really are. And uh, the contents are tailored to be friendly, let's say, and, but not accurate. And so who really cares about talking about our um, own diversities? I think it's a paradox. It's a kind of new marginalization on the basis of inclusion. I would like to like uh, send this kind of uh, controversial message. <laughs> no, no, that's definitely useful to talk about because, you know, visibility can be a kind of sometimes a two way, you know, a double edged sword, as it were. Um, Nikki, what's what's your take on this? Um, if you want to sort of talk a little bit about Italian media as well, that'd be great. But also do tell us about what, what you think about the representation of LGBT plus issues in, in the UK media. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to hear Marco talk about uh, the perspective from Italy. Of course, I, I do cover Italian football, so I have a certain perspective on it, but a, a very different one, I'm certain, to Marco's living in Italy and, and covering specifically LGBT issues. And I think what he said really chimes with um, my experience consuming um, uh, Italian media and also talking within sport to people, which is, I, I think there's still much more of a culture around Italian sport with um, sexuality, certainly, of, of don't ask, don't tell. Um, we just don't talk about it. It's something that, that is kept out. Whereas I do think that in British media, not just in sport, I think we have a, a very different um, reality when it comes to LGBT issues. And I think it's still uh, a multi-faced reality sometimes. I think that to sort of again to stick within my area which is, is is sports journalism i think that there is a great warmth and enthusiasm for personal stories people are very happy to talk about individuals and their happy relationships their happy experiences coming out and and the things that they've been able to achieve since coming out and the things that the ways in which they feel their lives have improved where they have um and i think there's still um a sort of gap between that, for instance, and um, then, uh, first of all, uh, the sort of areas where there aren't still our athletes, I think, for instance, men's football remains this area where we haven't had any high profile, certainly top uh, uh, league players coming out in, across European football. And sometimes there's... Um, well, there's a, a genuine sort of desire amongst, I think, a lot of the LGBT plus community to see people feel able to come out and, and to do that. There's also this sort of accompanying slight salaciousness, I think, from parts of the tabloid media in the UK. It's probably quite off-putting to people who might be in that position and might consider in coming out because the way that these topics get talked about you know, uh, to, to use an English um, phrase, it's a sort of curtain twitching, look what the neighbours are doing about it, which I think is 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 sometimes, um, it's not hostile, but it it still makes this thing out to be something um, uh, different in a way that is, um, I can't quite find the right word for it, but something that would be to talk about. And I think there's a, a really fascinating contrast with, for instance, um, the first NFL player, Carl Masib, who came out as gay in America, and the way that he was able to tell his story in such a off-the-cuff and... Um, understated way on social media where it was a, a quick video he posted on his social channel saying oh hey you know by the way I'm gay and, and that's you know kind of the end of that conversation um I think we haven't got all the way there in in um in in the British media with, with certainly the men's sports in particular I think it's a very different picture again in women's sports and, and men's sports and then I think there's a third element in in the UK media which is I think that there is still a degree to which gay issues and trans issues are, are treated separately. And I think that there's been a really um, uncomfortable trend in the last couple of years. Trans issues are getting much more prominence. There are some 
a, a sort of ongoing back and forth that feel very circular in, in how they're discussed that are presented constantly in in this manner of a debate, which is a very uncomfortable way to discuss issues that affect people's real lives, whether or not they're being debated as as, as allowed to exist in public spaces. And on top of that, I find that those issues are frequently, you can see in sections of the British media, and this is less about sport, more broadly, what really makes these stories really uncomfortable, I think, is how often you see whole months worth of coverage from newspapers covering stories every day sometimes, without including a single trans voice in their coverage. I think that's a really astonishing element of some of the coverage in the UK is how the stories are sometimes being told by people who are not affected at all um, by the by the story. Um, yeah, no, and I think that's a good place to kind of ask a little bit about then the role of LGBT journalists in the media industry, because um, we'll come to LGBT specific media in a bit, Jolt and Marco, but um, be really interested to get your thoughts on um, you know, do we need LGBT journalists covering LGBT issues for the mainstream media? Do we kind of need that active hiring? But then again, LGBT journalists, you know, should we be allowed to just cover, you know, cover whatever we want, be a football journalist or, you know, I used to be based in Africa covering sort of economics and politics. Um, Jolt, when, in, when it comes to sort of Hungarian media or co coverage of Hungarian LGBT issues, do you think that it would be better for there to be more LGBT journalists covering those, or are you kind of happy with how things are going at the moment? Mm. In Hungary, there isn't so many LGBTQ journalists. Uh, of course, we work with LGBTQ journalists in, in human media, but it's important for us because uh, we we work with the straight <laughs> journalists as well uh, because uh, in in our magazine for in the printed magazine uh, it's a monthly uh, magazine we have 22 23 articles in a month in the magazine and we work with uh, more than 13 journalists not only three or four and uh, i think it's it's really good because we can we can uh, we can make we can do the magazine with the different uh, eyes uh, and uh, in the Hungarian mainstream media there are uh, some LGBTQ journalists but not a lot or we don't know <laughs> they are uh, we don't know uh, about their sexual orientation but uh i think um for example my colleague adam he's a really good journalist and uh, he started his work at human media and then he started to write articles for the other mainstream media as well and the first time when when he told me he he want to uh he wants to uh write to the other media uh, about LGBTQ topics, LGBTQ issues. Uh, I didn't like it, <laughs> but uh, but after that, I realized this is a really good thing if the LGBTQ uh, journalists write about the LGBTQ life in the ma uh, mainstream media because uh, they can uh, they can study. Uh, to the people, to the Hungarian people, uh, and uh, I think in, in Hungary there are more uh, influencers, uh, vloggers, LGBTQ vloggers uh, in the mainstream media, or they have a uh, own channel, uh, and they are they are uh, LGBTQ people, and uh, it's really good because uh, they have so many followers, uh, audiences, and uh, it's good for represent the uh, the Hungarian LGBTQ community. Sure. I, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, having having your own platforms and, you know, we'll come to discuss your you and Marco's publications in a minute. Um, that's definitely kind of, you know, one one solution, as it were, to the media landscape. But um, Nikki, I wanted to ask you what you what your thoughts are on sort of, you know, should it be LGBT journalists covering LGBT issues? And how do we kind of not pigeonhole, 
you know, queer journalists into only, you know, covering queer issues? Yeah, I, I think it's a great a great question and, and not a straightforward one because I, I still think one of the most uncomfortable moments I've had in a newsroom was uh, one of my early days as a journalist. I was I was working with a, a colleague who was who is gay, and um, the uh, a, a conversation topic came up about a certain uh, issue. I think it was actually about Premier League footballers and whether it would be possible for for a Premier League footballer to, to come out as gay. And an editor pointed at her directly with his finger, pointed at her in the middle of the newsroom, and said so and so I won't use their name but so and so, you're gay what do you think about this and I thought that was such a confrontational and inappropriate way to ask someone in the middle of a newsroom who I don't even know if they wanted sort of their sexuality to be a thing that was talked about amongst sort of everyone in the newsroom and and so there's there's sort of this competing thing that I think a lot of us have going on and that I have going on you know I have a, a career in journalism which is as a football journalist that's what I've sort of started out doing it's what I'm still doing and it's what I um, have my sort of main career driving towards and I don't necessarily want to stop doing that just to talk about LGBT issues because I am LGBT um, but at the same time I get very frustrated when I read like I say certain topics in the media certain topics that um, journalists who aren't LGBT uh, plus will cover for months on end without including voices from the LGBT plus community so I think there's there's sort of um, both things within me of sort of wanting everyone. Um, and I think that's such an important um, foundation stone of, of equality that we all want is we all want the freedom to live the lives we want to do, follow the pursuits and interests that we have. Um, but at the same time, I think it's hugely important that there are journalists who are LGBT plus who are covering these topics because otherwise our voices are not represented in those stories. Yeah, that's that's those are really, really good points, Nikki. Um, and Marco, what's the situation like in Italy? Um, are there many journalists working in the mainstream media? Uh, oh, we don't Marco. have a lot of openly gay, um, uh, uh, gay um, journalists, so I would not really I use LGBT. Frozen. Uh, us. Sorry, I'm so muted. Sorry, I'm on mute in my... Um, Uh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Um, I'm getting you All back right. now. Okay, sorry. Um, no, sorry, it's my name. We have very, very few, hopefully, um, gay journalists. I want to say LGBT plus because we do not have like journalists. Journalist uh, I think that an uh, LGBT plus journalist can precisely write about plenty of non LGBT plus topics if he, she, they are competent. Oh, unfortunately, we've lost Marco. Um, I think his connection might be quite bad, so that's a shame. Um, but um, we'll we'll move on for now, and then if Marco reconnects, we can sort of ask his thoughts um, more on this topic. Um, I, um, yeah, so I was going to talk about LGBT plus media and the role that it plays. Obviously, Marco's editor of Pride magazine in Italy, so we'd love to get his thoughts on that. Um, but Schult, um, do you think, you know, in, in a country like Hungary, but just in general in Europe, do you think that having LGBT specific media is still sort of necessary and important, especially, you know, if you've got sort of YouTube channels and, you know, Instagram accounts where these influencers are sort of sharing their stories, do you still kind of need like, you know, a specific news website, a specific news magazine for LGBT plus people. You're on mute, Salt. So my answer is definitely yes, uh, because uh, for example, for LGBTQI people, uh, the the LGBTQI uh, media magazines, bloggers, vlogs, uh, influencers, everything can help to uh, can help to the to younger uh, generation. Uh, they can get 
information about the LGBTQ life. They can get, uh, they can uh, read uh, articles about everything about the, about the LGBTQ life, like uh, LGBTQ life, uh, drag life or lifestyle, culture, uh, history, everything. We, we have, a, in our magazine, we have uh, so many different topics, so many different articles in every uh, every month and in the news portal at Human Online as well, every, every day. Uh, and uh, I think LGBTQ media uh, can help to, to accept themselves uh, for a younger generation. We got uh, we got uh, so many comments, email and emails uh, uh, from them, and uh, they wrote we we could help them to accept uh, themselves. Uh, so and they and the 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 other thing, if you if you see the LGBTQ news. At the LGBTQ news portal, or if you read, uh, if you open the LGBTQ magazine, you can get the information about the LGBTQ life. Only LGBTQ life. If you see the mainstream media, you can get the information everything about okay. life. And uh, the other thing, uh, in the human magazine and the human online, we had so many straight. Uh, readers and followers and for us it's a really good thing because so many uh, Hungarian straight people follow us and uh, support us as well and uh, we got uh, we got emails and the comments as well from them uh, they can with uh, with our articles and interviews they can get more information about sure. LGBTQ life, for, uh, and it's really important uh, because and they can they can get more information and they can understand the and LGBTQ. Sure, people. Marco, do you do you feel like this is a similar landscape in Italy when it comes to LGBT plus media that there's still a role for it and it also yes, you know, has a role. Yeah, because in general, any kind of LGBT media, they are affirming spaces. We give empowerment. I mean, we are not just uh, sexual orientations or gender identities or expressions. We are a culture. We have an heritage and we have to protect and to pass on to the uh, next generations. And also, um, uh, we show ourselves as we want. For instance, in lesbian magazines, women are not sexualized. In, uh, in, in the covers of, uh, of our magazines, you can really see uh, the, the diversity, the, the differences, you can send um, uh, messages. So that's why um, uh, we, we are still uh, incredibly important, both for ourselves and also for, let's say, in, in, the, in the other world. And uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely, I hope that um, uh, it's not easy for printed magazines, but um, uh, we, we have to keep on striving and surviving. Um, and something um, we spoke about, um, a slightly different topic now, but something um, we spoke about previously um, is how kind of certain events or certain sort of straight people raising the issue, raising LGBT issues and sort of suddenly like catapulted into the mainstream. So we'll use the example of the Euros because, you know, that's a topic I think, um, you know, some of us have expertise on, um, but how, you know, there are a lot of um, debates over, you know, whether there should be protests about Hungarian LGBT issues um, at the at the Euros, and this suddenly sort of created a huge discussion, and this was sort of very much driven by mainstream sort of straight media, as it were. Um, Nikki, what did you think um, about how there was a lot of discussions around LGBT plus issues around the Euros? Yeah, it, it certainly got centred, and it wasn't just uh, journalists. I think what um, most journalists are, are doing certainly. Uh, football journalists if we're covering um, football issues is we're, we're covering what's happening uh, on and around the pitch but when uh, a player like Leon Goretzka um, gives the the heart gesture to the Hungarian fans who've been 
um, giving a, a homophobic abuse during a football game and, and when there's been a big discussion in the days around that football game about whether or not stadiums in Germany can be lit up with the rainbow flag, it, it really centers the story in a way that actually is, is unavoidable. It means that um, you're going to talk about this issue. And I think that we saw really vocal support actually from, from uh, football players for, for more than one different country. I mean, the other one who's um, in my head right now is Jordan Henderson of the England squad who, who tweeted a supportive uh, message when a, 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 a football fan coming to watch an England game at Wembley who was non-binary said it's the first time coming to, to watch a game as a non-binary person who was out and and um, presenting in a sort of obviously I suppose what they would define as an obviously queer way and um, and they um, you know that being celebrated by an England international footballer and, and centred I think when you put that together with the other sort of very visible demonstration that was going on through the Euros, which was the, the um, kneeling um, before a kickoff for racial equality, I think those things actually really centred social issues, not just in, in a footballing conversation, but because Euro 2020 is such a cultural moment all across Europe, it probably centred these conversations in a lot of countries, certainly in England, um, as as conversations, even for people who weren't t really that interested in the football. So I think it's certainly made clear this summer that um, athletes, probably for better or worse, because, you know, not every athlete um, necessarily is going to um, have the same opinion on different issues, but athletes do have this tremendous power to put our attention on certain topics if they choose to. And Joel, how did you feel about all these footballers who probably majority straight, but at least, you know, um, presenting straight, uh, all these footballers um, and then the media covering them, bringing attention to, you know, the LGBT law um, in Hungary that for anyone who doesn't know, um, sort of banning um, content from being shown to children. Um, so what did it make you feel kind of seeing all this being covered in the media? You're on mute. Sorry. So uh, this situation is really shame and bad, and because uh, because uh, in this year uh, during the Euro 2020, uh, we we can we can read we could read uh, the in the news uh, about the <laughs> about the Hungarian fans habit. Uh, I think everything is about uh, everything is because the because the, the current situation because the Euro 2020 started in in June the Hungarian laws uh, the new Hungarian homophobic laws uh, came in June in the same time in the same time the Euro 2020 and if we if we see the football match in in 2019 in Hungary, nobody talked or showed about nothing uh, homophobic, uh, nothing about the homophobic uh, content. And now uh, these people uh, can, these people feel, oh, we can do everything. Uh, we can we can hate uh, LGBTQ uh, people because the government said it. This is the main problem. But um, in few weeks before uh, the no, we we had a we had a campaign in in this year. It's called Families Family, and uh, the Hungarian footballer. Uh, uh, Gulachi, uh, he he supported this campaign and he supported the rainbow families in Hungary, and then he got so many homophobic uh, comments, uh, and uh, the president of the Hungarian Football Association told uh, he he I think he had an interview I don't remember clearly. Uh, and he said, the sexual orientation is not the topic in the football. Uh, we are really welcome uh, 
uh, straight LGBTQ people, every everybody mm. at the football match at the football. And I'm really surprised that he he talked that because wow, uh, it's a really good uh, thing uh, from the from the president of the Hungarian Football mm. Association. Uh, but but we need to we need to kind of get on to our the q a section jolt um yeah. so if you just kind of wrap up here if that's okay okay, okay i i finished <laughs> thank you sorry to interrupt um mark i just want to finish off with you before we go on to the q a um and actually all three of all four of us um can give some sort of positive solutions for for newsrooms around europe to address lgbt issues but i guess just very quickly marco um do you think that we still need sort of straight allies to get LGBT issues positive attention in the media? And yes, uh, we do. And uh, because uh, and, uh, you must be committed to diversity, you need the credibility. And uh, if you want to talk about, let's say, normality, um, yes, we need uh, and more people that talk about uh, us being uh, competent. Uh, we cannot be only stereotypes because stereotypes we can ask. And uh, it's still a fight for legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So and, uh, in a way straight men, people, straight people, but especially straight men and, uh, need not. So yes, we need constant necessary vigilance. And the more we can talk about our issues or let's talk about our issues properly, the better it will be for everybody. Mm. And so what um, people who run newsrooms, editors, managers, what would you say, what would be your top piece of advice for them for better, better covering LGBT issues, better including LGBT journalists? Yeah. If possible to hire, to not, not be afraid to hire uh, LGBT plus journalists uh, and uh, give more space, uh, uh, not only just in June uh, to talk about um, uh, the Pride Month, or if some uh, kind of uh, LGBT related laws uh, should pass. We really need a, a broader and, and uh, more constant and, and, and a broader and, uh, narratives about, about our lives, not only just about, uh, about our lifestyles, about our culture, mm. about uh, our history and so on. Sure. Jolt, what's your top piece of advice for um, editors in, and managers in the mainstream media? From mute again. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat me because I can't hear. Uh, no, um, no, my connection is bad. <laughs> no worries. Um, what's your key piece of positive advice for editors um, in mainstream media um, for better covering LGBT issues? In Hungary, uh, all over, all over Europe, but if you <laughs> uh, because I think talk more about LGBTQ people, more talk about LGBTQ life. Uh, it's it's most important important thing now in in Europe, in the world, and in Hungary as well. Focusing to the LGBTQ topics because people don't know uh, enough information mm -hmm. and Nikki what's your key piece of advice I think uh, the the things that that seem important to me first of all as I, as I sort of touched on I, I think uh, certainly allowing LGBT plus people to have voices in LGBT plus stories is is a hugely important thing. I think for the same reasons I said before, I, I would love for editors to be sensitive about how they approach that. You can have a conversation with someone asking if they want to talk about a story without pointing at someone in the middle of a, of a newsroom and, and outing them in a way that, that I saw happen in, in that one situation. I, I think the other thing that I would really love to see in the British um, uh, way these things are covered is uh, less drive towards these so topics as a debate. I think we have this addiction to debate stories, um, not just in, in the LGBT area, but in, in all areas of, of journalism, because those drive clicks and clicks are 
of what so many people are chasing in, in the sort of modern online um, environment. But I think if we present everything and certainly LGBT lives and, and existence as a debate, then that creates space for there to be uh, hostility because there's always going to be the negative side of a debate. And I think that um, less of that and more of allowing people to just tell their stories would be a, a benefit to everyone. Thanks, Nikki. Um, and just before Q&A, my, my piece of advice would be don't be afraid to ask questions. Obviously, don't be aggressive. Don't be kind of, you know, but if you're genuinely asking questions in a sensitive, open way to somebody who is openly LGBT or an LGBT organisation, then I think that's a good way to kind of learn, learn about the issues as long as it's kind of done with an open, open mind. Thank you, Rachel, Marco, Sol, and Nikki for this amazing conversation again. In the chat, we have uh, participants sharing experiences, sharing challenges, and most importantly, sharing also alternatives and solutions. So thank you very much for this. And uh, I will start this uh, uh, conversation with a question from Misia. How can we get to a place where LGBT plus journalists are acknowledged and represented without being solely defined by their sexual orientation? Um, who, who would like to take this? Someone jump, anyone feel free to jump in. Uh, Nikki, yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not muted. I mean, I think this is um, this is uh, a really sort of personal question to me. Like I, I really feel this question and, and I know because when I came out, I um, came out and, and transitioned uh, very publicly because I had to, because I already had a public profile as a journalist before I, I made that step in my life. And so it was really important to me that I would continue to be acknowledged as, as who I am as a journalist, apart from this, um, you know, um, fact of who I am. And, um, you know, for me, I, I made a very deliberate step of writing one story, sort of introducing the fact that I was making this transition and then basically refused to talk about it to anyone in any interviews for more than a year because I didn't want that to be my story. Um, I think that uh, the thing that I would say is um, some editors are more or less pushy on that sort of thing. And I think that I was very lucky with my most sort of important editors. I'm freelance. I, I don't have one employer that my um, sort of biggest employers were quite happy to let me tell my story my way. And I think that is probably what we should all want from our editors if we're going to tell these stories that are personal, that they let us tell them our way and then Get, get on with doing the things that we that we're good at um and I think that um I don't know if that's enough for a system but I do think it's really important and speaking again just personally the thing I'm trying to do towards that end um is is just to do my job and to do it well and mm -hmm. yes come here into a space I think is appropriate to talk about these things and, and do that sometimes but most of my days are still spent covering football because that's my job Thank you, Nikki, for this answer. Now we have another question. How do you tackle the news regarding LGTB plus community uh, hate crimes in your respective countries? Um, Marco, given that Italy is debating a hate crimes law, I think this might be an yeah. interesting question for you. Yes, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, these uh, news uh, do not go a lot on the mainstream. There is a, a gay journalist, his name is Simon Alliva, who wrote, uh, one year ago, he wrote a, a book uh, and, uh, and about uh, hate, LGBT hate crimes in Italy, and he still tries to cover it, and he was also capable of having the cover of a very important weekly magazine, but it was just one-off. So, and, uh, it's still again, and, uh, if it's not talk about it, uh, it doesn't exist. So, and uh, they just try to put everything uh, an, uh, undercover. It, 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 it's, it's terrible. And, uh, and mainstream media talk more about, and it's horrible, of course, about uh, <clears throat> an uh, attacks on, on women. But it's very, very rare that uh, they we see news and about uh, attacks on LGBT plus people in Italy and there are really very awful situations. So we try to talk about it in our in circles so that, that can be like on Twitter or so, social media but it's a, <clears throat> it's a discussion that stays inside our community. 
<clears throat> it's not easy to make it feel like it's a real problem in Italy. And, uh, and also this uh, is not helping to have this uh, law against uh, homotransphobia, misogynism and ableism that is stuck in the Italian parliament. parliament. Thank you for your answer. And I think we have time for one last question from Francesco. Seeing how Nikki covers the NFL, I wonder if she sees the way USA sports are focusing more on representing the community. Uh, you can play project translating to the European sports scene as well. Uh, I think there's, there's already happening to some extent. I do think that um, when you look at how uh, top level uh, football clubs, soccer clubs uh, conduct their social media and, and approach these things, it's actually very similar now to how um, you know pro professional sports franchises in, in America do, the NFL, the NBA. I think there's sort of shared um, learning that's going on about how to sort of uh, approach these issues uh, publicly, but there's still certainly a lot of scope for um, governing bodies to, to to follow their lead and to start doing things that is a bit more proactive than just sort of lip, um, lip service on social media. And I think that is probably where um, football has this slightly greater challenge because football is an international sport. And because when you start talking about the big governing bodies like um, UEFA or FIFA, they are um, working with different realities in different countries, which we've touched on even today with the differences between the media landscape in, in England and, and Italy and Hungary. And I'm certain different, again, across many different um, countries in Europe. So um, I, I think that there are some lessons that can be learned. I think some of those lessons are being learned. Um, and perhaps, again, it's it's just inevitable, not desirable, but inevitable that these things happen a bit differently in um a continent that is many countries than uh, a big sort of single nation uh, like America. Thank you all again for this amazing conversation and for uh, giving us a little bit of hope that uh, things are going to improve. So now it's time to go back to the studio, Vera, Angie. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Uh, Rachel, Swold, Marco and Nikki. Thank you really for being here today at this News Impact Summit on Diversity, Equity and inclusion. And for openly speaking about the challenges the LGTBIQ plus faces in the media industry and to bring up solutions to the table to tackle them. Thank you again. Once again, we ask you, our audience, to let us know what you thought about this panel session. Please click on the link that Anna is sharing right now with you in the live chat. Very good. And up next, we are delighted to start our elevator pitch session with three speakers, a freelancer, a journalist turned podcaster and a managing editor who will tell us about projects that delve on portraying the stories and issues of people with disabilities, giving a voice to migrants and providing a platform to LGBTIQA plus uh, people. Each speaker will have five minutes uh, to talk about their projects and the presentations will follow without a break on this occasion uh, between them. I'm afraid the session doesn't include Q&A, uh, but you are more than welcome to write your questions uh, and comments, uh, messages to the speakers in the live chat, and we will make sure they get them. Uh, Angie, would you like to introduce our speakers? Yes, of course. Uh, the first speaker is Ria Andriani. Ria is an Indonesian freelance writer and musician based in Sydney. Ria has written on accessibility, arts and lifestyle for The Guardian, SBS, Open Literary Journal and Unbiased the News Project. Ria will provide a snapshot of how diverse people with disabilities are and some ideas on how to make the world a more inclusive and an accessible world for everyone. Next, we will have Lola Hierro, Lola is a journalist, photographer, and writer. Since 2013, she has worked for El País, mainly in the human rights section called Planeta Futuro. Lola is here to present today their last project, uh, The Language I Brought With Me. And last 
but not least, we welcome Aris Dimokidis. Aris is the manager of Micropragmata from LIFO, one of the biggest and most influential publications, both in print and online in Greece. Aris' work focuses on social diversity and LGBTQ plus issues. Ria, you are the first one to talk. Uh, so then goes Lola and then goes Aris. Don't worry about the time because I will keep an eye on it. So Ria, you start. Thank you so much, Angie. It's such, such an honor to be here and being part of today's News Impact Summit. Um, I'd like to share some, um, highlight the importance of first person journalism and um, why it's important, especially when you, um, someone like me, I'm part of the cross section of disability and also a minority group. Shared experience is a common currency of the way we live. So things like childhood TV shows, snacks, the way we celebrate milestones in life and also holiday traditions, things like that. But what about if your experiences are different to everyone else's? Um, so as I said before, I'm a migrant with disability, currently living in Australia. Um, I have congenital glaucoma, which means I became blind, blind since the age of five. Living as part of a minority group is something I have to do, even in my birth country of Indonesia. In navigating my world, writing first-person experiences is one way of telling my story and also making new connection and making the world just a bit more inclusive. Um, next slide, please, Angie. So my first ever article was about going to theatre. It was an audio described show called The Rabbits, which was an allegorical telling of the colonization of Australia by animals because it was written for children. I quote the tactile tour description. Gary, who was our lovely tour guide, showed us a long pole with a flag on one end and a gun on the other, which was which the rabbits planted on the ground to mark their territories. We felt the rabbits' elaborate costumes, such as the, the hat, the brass studs, gold medallion and trims and things like that, and how stiff the contraption of the, um, it, it felt quite boat shaped, um, which went around the torso. And also just how elaborate it was. Um, Sorry, my clock is going. I hope that's all right, everyone. Um, so in the pre-show note, it says that um, the black coat was full of indecipherable calligraphy, which was a bit like what they had in the books. So that was a nice connection from them. Unfortunately, it wasn't tactile, but just knowing that was there was um, what added a layer of meaning to to just kind of like having, oh yeah, that was a coat. Quite stiff, quite nice. Um, for the full article, you can go to the Guardian website and the link should be showing on your screen. And when you're ready, could you please go to the next slide? Playing tourist can be a fun but challenging experience if you can't see what you're looking at. On your screen right now, you should be able to see an extract from my piece, Seeing Through Perspective, which was a diary of my adventures visiting art galleries in Australia and the UK. I'm not going to read it out for brevity's sake, um, but you're welcome to check it out. It's part of the Overland Literary Journal. Um, and when you're ready, um, could you please go to the next slide? When COVID-19 hit in Sydney in March 2020, which was behind everyone else, admittedly, life changed very quickly. Amid the fear and uncertainty restrictions and 
also rules, one thing became quite clear to me. The public health advice was written for from the baseline of an able-bodied person in mind. I detailed some of these challenges for the Special Broadcasting Services, SBS, which is a great Australian publication that champions multiculturalism and diverse voices. Following the rules of social distancing, of social distancing isn't that clear cut when your world revolves around contact. Writing for this publication also allowed me to open up what it's like to be to go away from, Ria, from my birth country. Sorry. Ah, sorry, your time is off, but don't worry, we will share all the links uh, you shared with us in the live chat. Now thank you. is now is time. Thank you so much, Ria. Now it's time for Lola Hierro from El País. Hello there. Hello everybody from Madrid. Um, well, I'm going to talk about a podcast. Uh, its name is uh, in Spanish, El idioma que traje conmigo, así suena África en España, and in English it can be translated like the language I brought with me. This is how Africa sounds in Spain. So what is it? Well, you all know that the African lands are home to more than 2,000 languages, a lot, and some almost lost, but others are fully, fully alive. Despite the colonization by countries from the global north and the attempt to impose their own languages such as English, French, Portuguese or Spanish, today in Africa um, there are many other languages like Wolof, Swahili or Hausa, among others, that are gaining ground. But how do expats keep alive their mother tongue? Well, um, in Planeta Futuro, the, the section I work for in El País, uh, we have an idea that, in fact, it came uh, in a, during a coffee break, break with my colleague Nur Maktani, the other journalist who is involved in this project. Uh, we were thinking about this issue and we decided to show a piece of this linguistic treasure through those who have traveled from their original countries to Spain. Spain is a country where we have a lot of migrant people, so it should be easy. Well, uh, with Nigerian people, Malian, Senegalese, Kenyan, Guineans, all the African community is showing us through a series of interviews and podcasts what their language sounds like and what they do so as not to forget it and achieve it for future generations. Because as you can imagine, in Spain, they are used to speak Spanish or Catalan and other languages, but the mother tongue sometimes is easy to forget if you don't use it. So we divided this podcast in five chapters. Um, we started in January. In each chapter, several people from countries in the chosen region are interviewed. Interviews are audio pieces in which the protagonist tells listeners about his or her mother tongue. Not only how it sounds and how many people speak it, but also memories from the childhood and if, and if they are still using it at home, if their children are learning it. Then, well, every interview in the end is a tribute to an African language and to the efforts of many people to struggle, who struggle, sorry, to keep them alive despite the distance. So, well, as I said, um, we divided the podcast in six, five chapters, sorry, uh, divided in the, the regions that we have in, in Africa, North, West, Central, East and South. We have already published three of them for the North, the West and Central Africa. We are going to publish the fourth one in East, about East Africa. And on December, we will publish the last one about the Southern part of Africa, this last December. And well, I have to say that our goal is not only about culture, with thousands of Africans living in Spain, this project also aims to be a tool to stretch the distances among the diaspora and the Spanish people, because it's not a secret that Spain is a kind, kind country where we host thousands of migrants and refugees, but it isn't less true that we still face problems as racism and xenophobia in our society. So this podcast, The Language I Brought With Me, is an attempt uh, to show to our readers in El País, to our listeners, different narratives about our migrants, far from the typical news in media related to the illegal entries in the borders, the poverty and other negative discourses. We want to enrich the 
acknowledgement of our African neighbors. And well, at, uh, the last thing I can say is that we are almost to publish the fourth part of this podcast. As I said, it's going to be about uh, the eastern part of Africa. And we already interviewed people from Kenya, from Mozambique, from Comoros, from Tanzania, with a man who is a Maasai, from the Maasai tribe who lives in Mallorca. And also from Rwanda, we have a priest, a Catholic priest who lives in Catalonia. And also uh, from Ethiopia. So this is what I, can, what I can say about this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lola. You even had 30 seconds left. And now, Aris, is your turn. Yes, hello. Hello from Thessaloniki and uh, Greece. I'm going to talk about diversity in the digital uh, workroom uh, uh, regarding LGBT, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, people. Well, I, I'm, I have a little feedback, so I, I'm doing something. Okay. Um, when I was a teenager in the early 90s, there were very few programs or uh, articles about uh, gay people, and I was um, um, very happy even with the worst of them, and they were all the worst. Uh, they always, uh, the shows had always uh, uh, some priests uh, that were uh, talking against uh, homosexuals, uh, but uh, there were no out reporters or journalists, uh, and uh, I cannot um, um, uh, contain myself to compare with uh, the past with today in Greece. Uh, things are a thousand times better. Um, uh, rarely are abusive words used, um, apart from the uh, brave. Uh, uh, people, uh, celebrities uh, that uh, who came the out. Camera. Okay. Who came out? Um, they were very helpful. Some politicians. They had to change the the status quo. Uh, uh, Alexis Tsipras, the pre <laughs> previous prime minister, with uh, the um, civil partnership. Uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the current. Uh, even though he's a right-wing uh, prime minister, um, he scolded uh, MPs for homophobic uh, language and is about to hopefully uh, vote the uh, gay marriage for uh, everyone. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy with the, these uh, uh, things. It's not worse in Greece, but not better than the rest of the Europe. Working in one of the biggest uh, sites in Greece, LIFO, which was open from day one to my proposals about the coverage of gay issues, it gave me a chance to write and record various articles and podcasts about the issues that are important uh, uh, for our community. Someone gave me the opportunity to talk about these issues when I was a junior, junior reporter and now as a manager, uh, I feel it's my turn to give the others uh, the opportunity to talk about their truths. When we hire, we don't care about genders or sexualities. Uh, I won't hire a trans person over a straight if they're not better in journalism. However, diversity in the workroom is positive when you actively search for people who will cover certain issues gender or equality or race uh, in these cases they are almost mm, the, there are almost never better candidates than uh, uh, those uh, from those backgrounds so by now creating job positions and descriptions that give the former outcasts of society uh, a chance to find their voice uh, you can fill the workroom, the digital workroom in my case, with diversity. Even though we're not a gay publication in our workroom, in our workroom we have and treasure uh, lesbians, gay, trans people, everyone. At the beginning they were writing only about things they already knew because they were better at it. Now they write about everything. I hope that very soon it won't be necessary to have 
certain specialized positions in order to uh, hire people from diverse backgrounds. And I also hope that this will be something that everybody does, all mainstream outlets, not only the most uh, progressive uh, of uh, those. So I'm done. That's it for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, as well as uh, Lola, you even had uh, 30 seconds left. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much for your... Can I give it to your... Ria? <laughs> My 30 Sorry? seconds. Can I give them to Ria? Uh, absolutely. That absolutely. This is a really nice gesture. Thank you, Aris. <laughs> yes, I have to talk faster. Um, so, um, yes, as, uh, as Angie said, um, you can check out all the works that I've done, uh, especially about the When Help Hurts from Unbiased the News. Thank you so much for having me here and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Thank you, Aris. And thank you very much, Lola. This was really a really mini marathon, but we are very happy to, to have you here and sharing your work with us. And we are looking forward to seeing more of your work in the future. And now uh, we would like also to know your opinion about the Ria, Aris and Lola's work. So they have inspired you to create and start your own DI project. So please click on the link that uh, I'll be sharing with you in a few seconds and let us know. Thanks a lot, Angie. Uh, indeed, I just wanted to mention, uh, we will share about uh, Ria's, Lola's and Aris's uh, work in the EJC social media as well. Uh, of course, these were very brief presentations, so make sure to, to check our Twitter account uh, to follow their work. Uh, and we are almost wrapping up our summit. Uh, we are delighted to do so in the company of Tembi Wolf. Until recently, Tembi was with uh, Vice Germany, and she currently co-chairs the new Deutsche Medienmacher Ihnen, the largest network of journalists of color and journalists with immigration biographies in Germany. Uh, Tembi is here to present the organization's recently published and brand new manual for uh, diversity, and she will explain to us uh, how it can help newsrooms solve their lack of representation. Tembi, welcome to the News Impact Summit on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. We're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me. Um, as you heard, I'm a journalist by day and an activist by night. Um, uh, we, the New German Media Makers, we stand up for good reporting uh, and for diverse media personnel in front and behind of the cameras and microphones and the editorial desks and everywhere, the planning staff, the management floors and uh, the supervisory bodies. Um, and today I'm very excited. Um, I'm excited to be here, but not only that, I'm excited because um, later today I'm casting my ballot um, you may know we have elections coming up in Germany this week. Uh, and Sunday marks the end of an era for us. Um, Angela Merkel is um, resigning. And this is an incredibly exciting time. Uh, there's an uncertain future in front of us, uh, a shift in paradigm. We have no idea whether our future will be green or conservative or liberal or social democratic. However, if you watch German television, you wouldn't assume that I care about all that, um, that people like me, people of color, um, people with an international history care. Uh, because German talk shows discussing the election are almost all white. In fact, more men named Wolfgang are invited to them than people of color. Um, and of course, that's not a problem that we only have in election times. Um, I, I recently learned uh, that this is not a problem that talk show hosts aren't aware of. They know. Um, I learned that two years ago because two years ago, we, the new German media makers, we awarded German talk shows a prize, a negative prize called Goldene Kartoffel, Golden Potato, for subpar reporting on a diverse society and for the fact that migrants and people of color are almost never invited to their panels. And if they are, uh, to either debate migration or racism. 
the golden potato also included an offer to talk about that issue. And boy, they wanted to talk and they were furious. They felt we had called them racists. They were well aware of the problem, they said, and frantically looking for people of color to include in their panels. They wanted to, they simply couldn't find any. You, now you have to know about Germany. Today, 25% of Germans have an international history. 25% have a parent or grandparent that was born outside of Germany, which is the definition. And in the generation after me, I'm 30 years old. In the generation after me, it's 40%. 40% who have an international history. In some big German cities, they, we, are already the majority of people under 30. Now, in German newsrooms, that number, that same number, is 5%. Five. The rest are white Germans. So two years, two years ago, we were very interested in whose fault that is, especially if even the talk shows are trying to change, but they can't. So we conducted a study or credit where credit is due. We asked the University of Cologne to do it for us. Uh, and they talked to editors in chief of the 122 German media with the highest, um, widest reach. And they found out something that didn't surprise us. And they found out something that did surprise us. Now, German media is a closed shop that doesn't surprise anyone. Uh, the results show that only 6% of the editors in chief of German media have a migration background. And if they do, they are from countries like Denmark or France, actually. Groups that are affected by racism and discrimination are not represented at all amongst editors in chief. Those not very diverse editors in chief also have no idea how diverse or homogenous their editorial teams are. They apparently don't want to know because they don't ask. Uh, the migration background or similar diversity characteristics um, are not elicited in newsrooms or media companies with one exception, which is an international outlet um, uh, that has an office in Germany. But all of that was not surprising to us, uh, but surprisingly, most editors in chief want to change that. They consider diversity in editorial offices to be positive and desirable. They know that they are lacking, although hardly anyone is prepared to do anything about it. So we, we saw there's a will to change things. Um, they just don't know which way to go how to make their staff and reporting more diverse, how to do justice to their democratic tasks to address all people in Germany and not to overlook any of their stories and voices. That's when um, we decided to, um, to write a guide, um, a manual aimed specifically at German media houses because there wasn't any. Uh, I was it asked very politely to not make this keynote uh, a promotional piece for our guide, but it's free anyway, and uh, it's only available in German uh, at the time, so perhaps I'd be forgiven. Uh, in our manual, which uh, contains 144 pages um, uh, of texts, um, you will find a selection of what we as an organization have learned over the years arguments and facts for more diversity, why media need more diversity to survive, which is a really good point to make, um, biases in dealing with diverse media personnel, tips and tools, checklists and best practices for reporting, essays and uh, perspectives. So it's a wild mix. Um, there's tips on how to find uh, professional wording, wording that's not discriminatory, um, low discrimination photo reporting and guidance on how to, how to help media companies on the road to diversity, how to get diversity and discrimination right, how to find and retain the best talent. Uh, plus there's num numerous uh, articles about, um, from, from uh, guest authors, journalists, academics, and other experts. Uh, actually, you heard about the BBC 5050 Equality Projects earlier. We, um, uh, explain that in the book as well. 
And on page 145, there's an empty to-do list with lots of space uh, for anything that needs to change in the media company uh, that you're working in. When that guide, 145 pages, was ready to print, we were a little scared because we were afraid that something that would happen that often happens when bosses deal with diversity. They call, they order a stack of this diversity book uh, for the diversity working group in their company. And then they check the item diversity off their list for the next quarter. And then they proceed to more important matters like getting their subscriptions up. So we came up with the trick. The price for the book, the book is free, you remember, was one hour of time. One hour of time with the editor in chief. Without the editorial team, without the diversity working group, one hour of full responsibility for the diversity issue. No one to delegate it to, because we thought diversity must be a matter at the top level, a matter of the bosses. And what happened was something we didn't expect at all. We got emails from all the German media, big TV stations and startups, conservative and left-wing radio stations and social media, even ad agencies and platforms for theater critique that we had never heard of. So between 50 and 60, German media bosses actually wanted to talk to us. They wanted to give us an hour of their time and they all wanted to have diversity, but they didn't know the way there. Now, we are, as an organization, what you would call in German a Scheinriese, a seeming giant. Um, our issues resonate, but we're actually pretty small. Our association has 200 members and a network of about 1,200 supporters. Our board, however, has seven members, all of whom are volunteers and have, including me um, and my co-chair, we have all full-time jobs in editorial offices and studios or work as freelance journalists. But we had promised the hour of time, so we blocked out our lunch breaks for the next few weeks and met all the media bosses. None of us are diversity trainers or management consultants. And that sometimes did cause irritation at first, because that's what they expected, those editors in chief that wanted to meet us. But in the end, it was a big advantage, because German media still see diversity as a decoration, a decoration and nice to have to demonstrate goodwill. So we went in and told them, no, inclusion is a question of good comprehensive reporting of professionality and democracy. It's a professional issue. Now I know you work in media around the world, in the US and Canada and in India or Kenya, where the diversity of population might be a part of the identity of your respective countries. It might even be written into the constitution. Um, Germany has been a country of immigration for a long time, but that has not yet entered in the pub public conscience. So when an all white panel is discussing the Corona crisis at a time when it's mainly people with uh, people who live in migrant hotspots who are getting sick, that happens and no one flinches. It's always been like this. It's white people discussing everybody's issues. That's why a paradigm shift in newsrooms, we think, we feel, must come from the top. It must be a part of the company identity and ingrained in the culture throughout all of the media business. Our talks with the editors in chief um, in our lunch breaks went as to be as, as uh, was to be expected mixed. We met some bosses who spent weeks working on job advertisement for editorial jobs just to make sure that everybody feels welcome. And bosses, we met bosses who thought having a story about Ramadan would do. Uh, one of the big misconceptions was, especially in the big media with a wide reach, um, that we wanted to promote young talent. 
we were told that there was a promising Turkish lady among the new trainees and one that may or may not have roots in Poland, but we're not quite sure. So we said, well, we would have loved to hear that in 1999. Uh, actually, now we are past trainees. It's about your head of feature section, your morning show anchor, and your senior staff. Because after six years of labor migration into Germany and four decades, uh, uh, six decades, of course, six decades of labor migration into Germany and, and four decades of refugee migration, we are beyond young talent. It's time for the executive chairs to be diverse. Uh, also, we have worked with young people for 10 years and um, we've provided them with uh, education and mentorship. And we know that they work hard. They do so many unpaid internships, uh, even when they can't afford it just to get their first paid jobs and then they quit. They quit because the editorial culture is not right, because they experience racism in newsrooms, because they are stigmatized or they simply don't feel their voices heard and appreciated in, in an all white newsroom. Uh, so that kind of diversifying from bottom up is not really sustainable. So what did we learn? Five things. Um, First thing, it starts at the top and it pays to start at the top. Um, but without the groundwork of the past decades, newsrooms would not be ready for that. Second, it's easy to talk about diversity as a concept. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves to um, have that word on their website. But when it comes to sharing power, for example, through affirmative action, through quotas, media houses are really hesitant. The third thing we learned was we need to become more diverse ourselves. Uh, our guide includes chapters by guest authors, I mentioned, uh, on queer people in the media and the media industry, on the barriers that make it difficult for uh, children of working class parents to enter the profession, and on um, the difficulties of people with uh, disability, disabilities in the media business. We need to think all of those issues together and then join forces, which is why we are currently working on an intersectional update for the guide. And then the last thing, Rome or our media businesses weren't built in a day and they definitely cannot be diversified in a one hour conversation with the boss free of charge <laughs> by volunteers. Change has to be constant. It has to be constantly monitored, evaluated, and professionalized. Um, I, for one, hope that we can diversity roam a bit, maybe in the next four years, uh, in time for the next pre-election talk show panels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Tembi. Uh, we have some questions from our viewers, so I will I will ask them to you. We have mm -hmm. here first one from Doreen. Tell me how easy it is to venture in such a in such a reporting project like diversity in German Germany. How do you overcome any obstacles if you have faced any? Um well the main the main issue actually was um were the top levels. Um, we always worked with newsrooms for, for the past 20 years. Uh, we worked with um, very dedicated editors who wanted to change up the culture in the newsrooms. Um, but it was always a problem to get to the top levels. And I think what's kind of playing into our hands right now is um, that diversity is becoming an issue that people um, that, that people in charge feel like they need to tackle to to, um, to 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 make a good impression. It's a bit sad because <laughs> it's like PR playing into our hands, but uh, th that was the hardest thing to overcome to make the bosses uh, give up a part of their time, give up money uh, to tackle those issues and not just see it as... Um, decoration. Thank you, Tembi. We have here another from Pauline Tillman. 
your yeah. association Neue Deutsche Media Macherinnen published recently the diversity guide for German newsrooms. What are your top three tips for getting much more diverse in the German sphere? Let's talk about radical ideas. <laughs> um, I think tip one, two, and three is introduce a quota. A quota for your, um, for your leading staff, um, a quota for your new staff, and a quota for your protagonists. Uh, I mentioned recently the... Um, the um, 50-50 project uh, that you heard about today. Um, and it's actually, it was a bit disheartening to learn that without numbers, that's, uh, things are not going to change. This is not going to work. So introduce the quotas, monitor them, uh, make sure that you have a goal when they should be achieved and then work on it. But I think it, it's not going to work without without the hard numbers. We have one more question from Claire. Do you find the men women split was 50-50 in the German newsrooms? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm very clear, no. <laughs> and uh, tell me, the, the people ask when it will be available the guide in English. There are many questions that they are asking for this guide. Yeah, I imagine um, we are working on that. I actually, we don't have a um, fixed date yet, but you can uh, drop me a line if you're interested in that. And uh, I will send it to you as soon as we publish it in English. That's a, uh, yeah. But we are actually, I think one of the, one of the, points maybe I should have included that on the learnings but one of the learnings was um, collaboration is super important so if you and your countries have um, practical solutions to those issues if you have like manuals if you have toolkits that help might help other countries as well I think it's super important to share them one of the actually the BBC 5050 project I've been mentioning for the third time now <laughs> And um, that's one of the things I think in English speaking countries, that's um, pretty much known. Um, most German newsrooms, they're really happy to learn about that, to learn that it's like an easy way to do things. They, ha they hadn't heard about it before. They, they are happy that it doesn't cost a thing <laughs> to start. Um, so I think it's really helpful to um, collaborate and like cooperate and share resources. We have time for one more question, Tembi. This is from Sant Hauna today. Tembi, mm -hmm. can you elaborate how to balance between your ambition and responsibility as a journalist in the newsroom? Um, well, I... <laughs> um, uh, that's a question that really, I think, uh, everybody answers differently. I actually, I usually split between my professional work and my activist work. Uh, and I also don't really call myself an activist during the day. I actually make a really hard split as, as far as that's possible. Um, and I think it's really important, um, especially for young people, when they enter a newsroom that's all white and they're the only person of color, they feel like somebody has to write about those issues. Somebody has to write about um, racism uh, and race. Uh, and they feel like it's their responsibility to do so. And I think it's really important to tell them, no, if you want to write about ornithology, about birds, if you want to write about... Um, uh, the environment, just do that. You don't have to write about racism. No, no one of us is, is obliged to cover those issues. Uh, I think it's a really important thing to, yeah, to give people on the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tammy, for being here today and for closing the summit. It was an honor. Uh, I mean, for closing the summit with this guide on how to implement strategies within the newsrooms in order to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, also, we are looking forward to have it in English as well. I'm sure, well, our viewers uh, have taken notes to follow your recommendations at their workplaces. Have you? Please let us know in the link 
that Vera will share with you in a few seconds here in the live chat. So thank you all for being here today with us and thank you to all our speakers. So I think it's time to finish our event, right Vera? Yes, indeed. So our plenary sessions have come to an end, but there is still one fantastic workshop left in the program for those who wish to empower themselves a bit more. So before Angie gives you the details on the workshop, I would like to say that today has been a great meeting to discuss uh, and learn strategies and best practices to overcome hidden prejudices and improve diversity, equity and inclusion in your uh, journalistic work, but also the newsrooms. We hope you enjoyed the sessions, our speakers, the interaction in the live chat, and most importantly, that you are inspired and eager to share your knowledge and innovate in your coverage and in your workplaces. We'd very much like to, to say thank you to the Google News Initiative for making this summit possible and to all our media partners. We are also very grateful to our speakers uh, for taking the time to share their expertise and to all of you following the event live for the interaction and for making the conversation more diverse and more interesting. Uh, I hope to see you all next year uh, in more summits online or perhaps uh, in person, who knows, to continue these encounters and conversations about making journalism more innovative uh, and inclusive. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before I say my goodbyes too, I would like you to invite you all to join the exclusive I Am Remarkable workshop that our partner, partner, the Google News Initiative, will host exclusively for our live audience today in Google Meet. You can find the link in the live chat now. The I Am Remarkable is a Google initiative designed to empower women and underrepresented groups to speak openly about their accomplishment in the workplace and beyond, which contributes to breaking modesty norms and glass ceilings. The workshop runs for 90 minutes and it will involve practical exercises to improve your self-promotion skills and help you avoid unconscious bias. There will, there will be a discussion among the participants and you will be taking home some exercises to follow up to. This session will not be recorded on YouTube. So it, it, if it sounds interesting for you, you only have to click, to click on the link and join now the session. If, yeah. Yes, I think we're, we are done. Uh, now we are moving to the Google Meet uh, room. So for those of you who'd like to join uh, the, um, the workshop, we'll see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next year.